meeting held on the 15th of December. Members are asked to note the minutes which the Deputy Chairperson, Mr Roy Beggs, has agreed. Members should also note that the minutes of evidence from that meeting will be published later today in the official report available on the Committee's web page. Agenda Item 2 is a statement from the Minister for Infrastructure. The Speaker's Office received notification on the 9th of April that the Minister wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement which the Minister intends to deliver is included in your pack at page 7. I would like to welcome the Minister for Infrastructure to this meeting of the Committee. I would also like to welcome Ms Katrina Godfrey, Permanent Secretary of the Department for Infrastructure, who is accompanying the Minister here today. I invite the Minister to make her statement, which, as members know, should be heard without interruption. Following the statement, there will then be an opportunity for members to ask questions. I call the Minister for Infrastructure, Ms Nicola Mallon. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I am grateful for the opportunity to update the Ad Hoc Committee today. This is not an easy time for any of us. It is an unimaginable time for all of those families who have lost loved ones to COVID-19 and are denied by the same virus the traditional way of saying goodbye that we have known and drawn comfort from for generations. I begin today by sending my heartfelt condolences to every one of those families. I know I speak for all of us in this chamber when I say we are with you and you are in our prayers. The challenges we are facing due to coronavirus cannot be underestimated. The words crisis, emergency, pandemic are now everyday language. But, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, this is not everyday life. While we are dealing with the chaos, the pain, the suffering, we must also be strong and have hope that this extraordinarily difficult time will not last forever. I am proud to stand here a citizen of this place. Thanks to the efforts and the leadership across our community, we have seen positive signs that our health service is coping and that social distancing measures are working. But we cannot be complacent. As my colleague, the Minister for Health, has continued to stress, we must, all of us, continue to play our part, because each of our individual actions will determine the future of our community. It is a huge responsibility, and one I know the people of Northern Ireland are prepared to bear. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I wish to update members on my actions to deliver on my responsibilities as your Minister for Infrastructure. I am clear that addressing the unique challenges presented by coronavirus requires us all to work together towards the common goals of protecting the health and well-being of our healthcare workers and our citizens, and crucially, in saving lives. I welcome the opportunity to provide an update to Assembly members on the ways in which my department is contributing to the fight back against COVID-19. I wish to set out clearly for members that I am doing all that I can within my remit and powers, and also by working collaboratively to support executive colleagues, especially the Minister for Health, in our collective endeavour to support our NHS and to save lives. I am sure members will agree that there are fewer services more critical to our health and wellbeing than the availability of clean drinking water and the ability to treat effectively our wastewater. Through this crisis, Northern Ireland Water has worked tirelessly to ensure that those services continue. This has involved prioritising essential work and changing work practices to ensure that social distancing rules are adhered to. Keeping staff and customers safe has been, I know, a key focus of Northern Ireland Water. Northern Ireland Water's frontline workers are undertaking essential maintenance and repair work to make sure that our water keeps flowing and that our drains don't get blocked. And I would encourage the public to show them support. They deserve our respect and our thanks. Northern Ireland Water is also doing what it can to support its customers. I am pleased to be able to announce that Northern Ireland Water will not implement the increase in tariffs planned for April and will hold off until October at the earliest. 
The company will also defer issuing bills until July at the earliest. This will create a short-term cash flow problem for Northern Ireland Water, but I am putting arrangements in place to resolve this within my current budget cover. More concerning, however, is the very sudden loss of income from the non-domestic sector as a result of this crisis, which will not be recovered. This is creating a serious gap in Northern Ireland Water's operating budget, which must be met. I have already raised this matter with the Minister of Finance and executive colleagues and will continue to work with them to find a resolution that manages this risk, protecting this vital service and protecting our communities from COVID-19. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to turn to the issue of connectivity. The need for connectivity at a time when we are separated has never been greater. Now, more than ever, it is so very important that we continue to manage and maintain our transport network. We must ensure that emergency services can be kept moving and that key workers, including healthcare staff, equipment and supplies, can travel safely or be transported to where the need is greatest. Our ports and airports, the key gateways into the north, are struggling during this crisis to maintain air and sea connectivity. The ban on non-essential travel, which is needed to fight this pandemic, means that passenger numbers have plummeted. In addition, as non-essential businesses close, the downturn in manufacturing production has also had a significant impact on our hauliers and ferry operators. These sectors are interconnected. We rely on our ports, ferry companies, hauliers and airports to ensure supply chains are maintained. If we fail to maintain resilience in those supply chains, it will impact each and every one of us, and it could impact our ability to restore our economy when the health emergency recedes. I want to assure members that I am doing everything I can to ensure our ports, ferry companies, hauliers and airports receive the support they need so that they can continue to provide the connectivity and the critical supply chains we need, especially between here and GB. As well as working on a cross-departmental basis, in particular with the Economy and Agriculture Ministers, I have been engaging with my counterparts in Wales and Scotland, with the result that we have been able to set out a clear and compelling and shared case to the Secretary of State for Transport for intervention to support supply chains. I am also continuing to engage with my counterpart in the South as we need to maintain the critical supply of food and, in particular, oxygen through Dublin Port. As well as focusing on ferry links, we are also very much focusing on the needs of our hauliers so they can stay in operation and are able to maintain the supply of critical goods for us and ensure that essential trade from here to GB and from Dublin to the north can continue. As I have said several times, information sharing and cooperation across these islands is key in the fight back against COVID-19. In addition, members will be aware of changes I have made to the requirements relating to driver's hours to secure and maintain deliveries and movement of all important goods that people in our communities, in particular vulnerable people, need at this time. This temporary relaxation of the rules reflects the current exceptional circumstances we find ourselves in and must only be used where necessary. I will continue to keep the position under constant review and will ensure measures are taken to extend the relaxation further if required making sure that the balance is maintained between relaxation and road safety as we protect our community at this difficult time. Our public transport network continues to play a key role in facilitating essential travel, including for many in our health and social care sector at this difficult time. It is for that reason that the public transport network continues to operate, albeit in a reduced capacity. TransLink has introduced working practices to ensure all staff who attend work can follow social distancing guidelines. Gloves and hand sanitizers are being provided to all frontline staff, 
and protective screens have been fitted to all buses in use. All staff carrying out cleaning duties are trained to follow a safe system of work and I am assured are given the correct PPE. As a small token of our appreciation to the life-saving work that our health care colleagues are delivering, I have introduced free public transport for health workers during the COVID-19 outbreak. TransLink also continues to engage with all of the health and social care trusts, offering assistance for any transport-related services, including passenger transport or delivery services. This has been well received by all of the trusts and is providing important support to our workers while they face unprecedented pressures. In relation to ensuring connectivity across the region for key workers and goods, I have supported the Rathlin ferry operator and the local community on Rathlin to ensure that essential goods, services and support continues to be provided to the island. Community transport operators have also been contributing to wider efforts to support the vulnerable. I have been heartened to see how community transport operators have transitioned their services to assist with the delivery of prepaid groceries, prescriptions, food parcels or fulfilling essential journeys. And I am pleased that, with the support of Minister Putz, I have been able to support them in doing that. The outbreak of COVID-19 has caused significant challenges and changes to a wide range of businesses, and the taxi industry is no exception. The regulations introduced by the Health Minister allow taxis to continue to operate, but they do so in a context where only essential travel is permitted, and I know they are facing real challenges. My announcement last week provides for the automatic renewal without prior testing of taxi vehicle licences which were due to expire during the current emergency. This will ensure that these vehicles can remain on the road during this period. This is a temporary measure reflecting the exceptionally challenging times of this current pandemic. My officials are also working urgently with officials in the Department for Transport to find a quick solution to licences requiring medical assessment. As soon as I am in a position to update affected drivers and members, I can reassure you I will immediately do so. At the same time, I have been encouraging other ministerial colleagues to respond to the needs of taxi drivers and operators with clear health and safety guidance on keeping drivers and customers safe, and to explore opportunities for the sector to repurpose their services to play a wider role in supporting those who are being shielded or who are vulnerable. I will continue to work with ministers to ensure that we do all that we can as an executive to assist taxi drivers who are a key part of our transport network and should be supported at this time. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, the need to avoid non-essential travel and maintain social distancing in line with government advice has also made it necessary for me and all other ministers to prioritise services and determine which departmental functions should be significantly reduced or stopped during this emergency period. In determining which services to prioritise, I have reflected the need to stop the spread of the virus and save lives and the need to support those working to keep us safe and keep our critical supply chains open and to protect livelihoods. A further consideration is to ensure that we keep a focus on the work needed to avoid unnecessary problems or difficulties that could divert the emergency services or disrupt necessary travel, while, mant while maintaining support for the most vulnerable in our communities. In common with other departments, my department is ensuring that staff who can work from home are not required to be in the workplace. Where a job can be done from home, my senior team has made clear that staff are expected to work from home. And I am pleased to report that this is happening. We have also moved a number of our services online, including DVA's driver licensing renewal service. There are, however, some services that people rely on and that simply cannot be delivered from home, including essential works on our transport, water and sewage infrastructure. Where staff do have to come into the workplace or onto a site to perform an essential role, 
then all necessary steps are being taken to protect them. This includes ensuring adequate social distancing and that appropriate personal protection equipment is made available and used in line with the relevant guidance. In order to protect staff and enable my department to focus resources on responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, a number of departmental functions and services that could not be considered essential have, however, been stopped or significantly reduced. I have suspended parking charges for DFI-operated on-street parking and parking enforcement, with a small team retained to respond to illegal parking that is unsafe or blocking access to or for emergency or essential services. Driver and vehicle testing for all but emergency or essential services has also been temporarily suspended. Reducing or stopping these services has meant that we can refocus some of our efforts to support our health trusts in the fight against COVID-19. I can assure members, however, that I understand the inconvenience that this presents and that this situation is being kept under regular review in line with public health advice. Turning to planning, I also want to highlight for members some of the steps I have taken to ensure that our regional planning system continues to function effectively. Thus far, I have issued letters to councils urging a relaxed and positive approach to enforcement, specifically around essential deliveries, and also for pubs, restaurants and cafes providing takeaway services during this emergency period. My officials have also provided information and advice to all 11 councils on the ongoing operation of the planning system through this time. We will continue to play our part within my department by progressing the statutory casework we handle, including notified and called in planning applications, and also to discharge our responsibilities on councils' development plans. I also hope shortly to bring forward a legislative amendment to the Assembly which, subject to members' agreement, would temporarily remove the requirement to hold a public event as part of the pre-application community consultation for major planning applications. To support this, I would also propose to issue guidance for applicants and councils on appropriate replacement measures to ensure that public participation in the process is not compromised. I am also aware that the operation of council planning committees has been impacted. My officials have moved quickly to approve amended schemes of delegation to reduce the number of applications which would be required to go before planning committees. They have also been liaising with councils in the Department for Communities who are working to prepare regulations concerning the meetings of district councils which would, if agreed, enable committees to operate effectively during this time. I can assure the Assembly that in planning and right across my department's functions, we will continue to work closely with other jurisdictions, councils and planning stakeholders to explore the obstacles and the temporary solutions needed to get us through this period. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, throughout this period, however, I have maintained a focus not only on the responsibilities of my own department, but also on how my department can make its skills and resources available to support others, particularly in our health service. Through the use of DVA vehicle test centres and Belfast and Newton Arts to date, I am proud to have been able to support the Health Minister in helping to rapidly increase testing to save lives. My department has also provided storage space at depots in Dungannon and Craigavon for use as required by the Southern Health and Social Care Trust. This has freed up much needed space in Craigavon Area Hospital and provides a local secure and accessible facility for daily transfer of supplies. A further approach for storage base in the Greater Belfast area has been received from our health service colleagues and we will do whatever we possibly can to assist in meeting their needs. I have provided access to free parking at Crumlin Road Jail for healthcare workers based at the Matter Hospital. And from last Friday, I also opened up access to this site at the jail for Belfast Health and Social Care Trust to facilitate decontamination of ambulances and disposal of contaminated PPE material. I want to put on record 
my appreciation to all of the staff in my department. From the beginning of this crisis, they have worked tirelessly to find solutions to the new challenges this virus continually presents. We are all in this together, and in my department, we will continue to do all that we can to support the work of Minister Swan and our healthcare heroes as they put their lives on the line to save ours. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, in closing, there is no doubt that these are incredibly challenging times. Sadly, it is likely that in the days ahead it will get even more difficult. However, we must continue to work together and support each other to ensure we continue to deliver for all of those who rely on our public services. Together we can get through this. And never before has the message been so clear to the people of Northern Ireland to stick together while staying apart. My message to everyone at home is that all of us can and we must play our part. The advice is clear. Stay at home to save lives. And by looking out for each other, we will get through this, we will recover from it, and we will be stronger as one community for it. Thank you. I thank the Minister for making her statement. Uh, a few housekeeping rules members. Uh, I will allow around an hour for questions to the Minister, as this is a committee meeting and not a plenary meeting of the Northern Ireland Assembly. It is appropriate, if the Minister wishes, that she can seek uh, answers from the Permanent Secretary, uh, as well as providing them herself. Uh, there are 21 members listed as wanting to ask a question. So therefore, it's very important that members ask a single focused question that relates to the statement that the Minister has just made. The one exception that will be made for this is the chairperson of the committee, who I call now, Ms. Michelle Mahoving. Thank you, Mr. Dep Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the statement um, from the Minister and congratulate her, the Department, TransLink and Northern Ireland Water for stepping up and doing all they can during this very difficult time. I'd also like to place on record my condolences to those families who have lost loved ones and to pay tribute to the key workers who are continuing to serve our community. Just with regards to the haulage sector, the Minister refers to connectivity and protecting critical supply chains. Is she satisfied that everything is being done that can be done in relation to increasing the maximum permitted authorised weights for vehicles and, most importantly, working with others to provide the urgent financial support that hauliers require to ensure the continu uh, continuity of both our medical and food supplies? And then turning to, to planning, and I appreciate the, the Minister has outlined some of the things which she plans to do, but does she intend to introduce measures to extend planning permissions, which are approaching the expiry of the time limit for development, similar to Section 8, Schedule 7 of the Coronavirus Scotland Act, which provides for the extension of permissions due to expire within six months to be automatically extended by 12 months? I thank the Chair um, for her questions. In terms of I address the first around the, the haulier situation, um, the Member will be aware that we have brought forward a number of relaxations in terms of enforcement of driver's hours. We have also uh, extended MOTs for lorries um, and we have also relaxed uh, rules around deliveries of stores to try to assist. Uh, the one area that we are still exploring is the one that she has highlighted around weight uh, and that is something that we are actively considering and working with the sector on. Uh, in terms of the package, um, the member is absolutely right. Uh, our hauliers are critical in ensuring that we have the secure supply of food, uh, medicines, uh, PPE and other vital supplies. I have been in very regular contact with um, the Department for Transport um, in England. Uh, we have fed very closely into putting Northern Ireland's case forward for um, the business case for a financial package for our ferry operators and also our hauliers. Uh, and we'd be hopeful 
hopeful that that is being considered actively by Treasury at the moment. We would be hopeful that they will recognise the critical impact that it will have here. I can assure the member that I will continue to make representations uh, to ministers uh, in England, also continuing to work with my colleagues in Scotland and in Wales, and also with my colleagues uh, in the South as well, because the member may be aware that we are wholly reliant on Dublin Port uh, for our access to oxygen. So while we're not in a position to know when a package will be uh, announced, I would be very hopeful that we will get there very soon. We have pressed on the Department for Transport and Treasury that time is of the essence and we need to have intervention urgently. Brave last thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And could I uh, thank the Minister for her statement and welcome the measures she's introduced to date. But I just want to take her back to the taxis issue. And I know she man mentioned the uh, medical assessment, but there's also the issue of peri periodic training and CPC. And I'm wondering, obviously, they're very anxious out there within the taxi industry at the minute, those people who are waiting to renew their license. So can she give a commitment to uh, resolving this matter as soon as possible? And also, would she, would she um, agree with me that the taxi industry needs a cash injection at this time as well? Go ahead, uh, Thank you. Thank the member for his question. Um, as the member will know, we had to bring in new legislation in order to be able to extend the PSV. It did take um, longer than I would like, but it was a much more complex issue than just issuing um, the TECs. There is the issue of the uh, medical assessments, and that is presenting a particular problem because, rightly, our healthcare workers and our GPs are very much focused on the fight back uh, against COVID-19. Um, but I want to assure members that we are working urgently on trying to find a solution on that, on that issue. I recognise that it is a difficulty, and if it is required to change legislation here, I will do it. I'm very much focused on finding a solution. In relation to the, the training, um, as a member will know, um, there are, I think it's 35 hours of training required over a five-year period. A number of the trainers have brought online uh, training versions, and I would encourage drivers um, to take that up. But the member may also be aware that um, DVA, we made an announcement that DVA is content that no enforcement action will be taken against drivers whose CPC uh, has expired between the 1st of March 2020 and the 30th of September 2020. Um, and I would also anticipate that this will likely to have to be reviewed again in due course, given that so many elements of the um, training and the licensing process have been impacted uh, as a result of this crisis. So to assure you on that front as well, um, there is no doubt that the taxi industry has been hit hard by this. I have been working with executive colleagues and we did push the um, UK government for a financial package for the self-employed. There are flaws with that in terms of the time it takes to be able to access it, but I also am very cognisant of the fact that there are a number of drivers who can't avail of that. Uh, the departments that take the lead on financial support for those whose livelihoods have been hit is the Minister for Finance, the Minister for Economy and the Minister for Communities, and I can assure the members that we, I have been raising this issue uh, with them. They are very aware of it and they are keen to explore what possible options there are. Thomas. Thank uh, you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I would like to thank the Minister for her statement today and for the leadership uh, that she has shown throughout uh, this very difficult period and the many actions that her department has taken. I think the fact that they have done so much is certainly reflected in the length of the Minister's statement this afternoon. I will take the Minister uh, back to taxis. I know Mr. Boylan has raised the issue. Undoubtedly, taxi drivers have been hit hard by this crisis. There is an obvious lack of fares, and there does seem to many drivers to be also a lack of fairness. Taxis have always been a valuable service, but now, in many instances, they are literally a lifeline. The Minister has referred to her officials working with the Department for Communities, who I understand are the lead for redeployment in this Department for Economy. She has also quite rightly pointed out as having a role. Can the Minister or could the Minister provide us with an update on what work the Executive as a whole is taking to support the taxi industry at this time? I thank the member for his question. Uh, and I was conscious of the length of the statement and can also assure the member that we had to take a number of action points out because officials in my department have worked so hard and have worked so hard with officials across DERA, the Department of Finance, uh, Department for Communities, right across uh, the executive. Um, 
On the issue of taxis, um, yes, I am responsible for the regulatory side of it, and I laid out in the statement the number of actions that we have taken to resolve issues. There are still some other issues, and we are working to resolve those. The issue uh, of financial assistance falls to other executive colleagues, and I know that they are looking at the matter. I have written to them, uh, and they have responded, and we are very conscious as an executive and as a collective that the difficulties financially that are being faced by the taxi industry. I have always thought, from the beginning of this crisis, when we started to see the scale of it, that the real solution for both the taxi industry uh, and also for those who are most vulnerable in our society is around the repurposing uh, of the taxi industry, redeployment so that they can deliver uh, prepaid groceries, because we know that is a problem in our su supermarkets, uh, around uh, medicines from community pharmacies and so forth. So I still firmly believe that there are huge opportunities uh, within that, and I know that the Minister for Communities is exploring options through local government um, to see what we can do there. And I have also committed that my officials are keen to work. There are no regulatory barriers to redeployment. Um, so it is something that I will continue to work with executive colleagues and with local government to try to progress. Because I think, given the severity of the situation, given that taxi drivers have been listed as essential services under the regulations, uh, given that as public we are being told to not engage in travel unless it is not essential, the taxi industry, by its very nature, will have to adapt, I believe, for this particular period of time. So to reassure that I am doing what I can on the regulatory side, but also working proactively with um, ministerial colleagues uh, with responsibilities in other areas so that we can provide the support that the taxi industry needs and deserves at this really difficult time. Thank the Minister for her statement and for keeping the Assembly up to date of relevant issues. In your statement, you referred to last week's decision uh, to enable taxi vehicle licences to be automatically renewed, reviewed, renewed without prior testing. Prior to that, MOTs were given extensions as a result of COVID and indeed uh, as a result of faulty lifts early on in the year. Some of those MOTs are coming to the end of their extensions. Can you assure those drivers that they too will be given uh, renewals so that they can keep their vehicles on the road, and this will apply to many essential key workers. I can give that assurance to the member, and um, we have done a considerable amount of work as a department to ensure that we are in a position where, if the need arises for a further uh, temporary exemption certificate to be issued uh, to motorists, that that will be the case. Though it is important to say that the trigger for that remains that the customer has to book the MOT appointment. That will automatically trigger a TEC if a secondary TEC is required. But to make the point that we have to encourage people to to make the booking uh, in the first place. The member will also know that as a result of this particular crisis, uh, we moved as a department to issue temporary exemption certificates to four-year-old vehicles. That was not the case previously. The other outstanding issue was the taxi drivers. Uh, we have now resolved that particular issue in terms of the PSV. But we are very conscious that as time goes on, uh, certain uh, customers will have to see a further extension of their TEC, and we are putting all necessary arrangements in place. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her statement. And I would echo the words of other members in terms of passing our condolences to those who have lost loved ones as a result of this um, COVID-19 crisis. I think it's, it's a terrible human impact upon everyone. I think it's something we need to keep in our minds. Um, I really do appreciate the update you have provided in relation to logistics. I think that's a real key issue. Um, there's logistics companies within my constituency who have built up their business over many years, families, and are now facing financial ruin. And I think it's really, really important that that support is given, particularly by the Department of Transport. So we're obviously looking forward to that uh, update, and I appreciate the work you're doing in relation to that. Uh, my question is in relation to TransLink. I would declare for the record that I was previously an employee of TransLink, but it's been reported that TransLink will potentially be needing £100 million uh, to be able to continue. The fares revenue for the company has plummeted. It is uh, very, very low now, since services are still operating, and I am really, really uh, grateful for the staff continuing to operate those services, but the patronage has went down. So, What are the plans for the Minister in the short and also medium term to safeguard the future of TransLink as a public transport operator in Northern Ireland? Thank you. I thank the member for raising uh, this issue. It is a very, very important issue. As you point out, uh, TransLink had already financial difficulties and from having to dip into its reserves over a number of years. 
Uh, that has been profoundly escalated as a result of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. We have seen a dramatic reduction in passengers, 90 to 95 per cent, across bus and rail, which has brought with it a dramatic reduction in income. So you're absolutely right. The financial pressures and the hole that is emerging in TransLink um, is deeply worrying. Members will also know that the Finance Minister uh, announced a COVID budget. Um, there was no allocation to DFI in that, uh, but money has been held in the centre. And I have received assurances from the Finance Minister uh, that money will be forthcoming in recognition of the very difficult situation financially that TransLink finds itself in uh, as a result of this uh, pandemic. The fundamental question, though, for all of us in this is, do we as an executive and do we uh, as an assembly believe in having a publicly owned public transport network? And I think that's the fundamental question that we will have to address. And also it's recognition of the fact, I think, that our public transport network is essential at this moment in time in transporting our key workers and our healthcare workers to and from work. It will be essential in our economic recovery. And it is, of course, essential in the other global uh, crisis that we all face, uh, the climate emergency. So I welcome receipt of the assurances from the Finance Minister that there will be further allocations within the COVID-19 budget. Uh, and I think TransLink is a compelling case for that. Uh, and I believe that that is rightly recognised by all executive colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his statement. There's some great work going on out there, both in transportation and in the infrastructure. Uh, Minister, you pointed out in your statement the importance of various networks of connectivity and transport and how crucial they are at this time. What guidance or discussions have taken place with companies who would assist uh, the road section of the department in maintaining the roads network at this time, particularly around the essential road maintenance programme? Thank the member for his question. Um, our officials are in very close contact um, with those who are, are, have contracts for this work. Obviously, um, we have the responsibility ourselves for our own staff. Uh, and we have been very clear that uh, where work is not deemed to be essential, it shouldn't take place. Where it is deemed to be essential and has to be on site, uh, social distancing guidance must be adhered to. PPE equipment uh, must be given to our staff because their safety is paramount. Uh, we're also working with contractors uh, those who can assure us that they can apply all of that guidance uh, and have that support and uh, protections for their workers, uh, we're working with them. Others are coming to say that they're struggling, they're finding difficulty in doing that, and we are working as closely with them as well. Because above everything else, the safety of workers, the safety of members of the public is absolutely paramount. There is nothing that comes before it. And I want to thank the Minister for, for her statement and I want to commend the, the frontline workers in your department that are supplying us with clean, safe drinking water, making sure the sewage systems operate and those in TransLink who are, who are transporting those in terms of the essential workers. So I want to just have, mark that down as well. Um, I have been contacted, I uh, had been contacted a few weeks ago from a number of workers very concerned about PPE in relation to your own department. So I want to acknowledge what, what you had said today um, about ensuring that that was all now in place. I would like to ask the Minister, have you been in touch with the trade unions to make sure that those workers are comfortable and confident with the protections that are in place? and that they feel reassured that the PPE that now is in place, that the protection is going to continue into the future as we live through this awful pandemic. Thank you, and I thank the member for her very kind comments about our frontline staff. They are doing uh, tremendous work, uh, and it might sound glib, but it is true that not all heroes wear capes. So I thank her for her recognition of that. Yes, I have been engaging um, with the unions. In fact, I have a teleconference, I think it's with NIPSA, um, on Friday, you lose track of days in the middle of all of this. But yeah, uh, actually on Friday, again, to talk about these issues, just again, seek reassurances. And I want to add to the tribute that you have paid to our frontline workers. I do not want to single out any uh, group in particular, because in my department, there are so many people doing tremendous work. But when I think of our TransLink workers, who are going out um, to their daily work to transport our essential key workers, 
Then, over and beyond that, what they're doing is they have redeployed their services across our health trusts so that they can transport um, staff to and from hospital sites. They're given over car parking free for uh, health workers who are working in hospitals and are having to stay in hotels at, the night, at night. Unite uh, Union, the workers in TransLink, uh, have been donating out of their own pocket money so that they can provide toiletries um, to our health care workers who are having to stay overnight uh, in hotels and in other places. So I, I think this feeds into a, a wider analysis that I think we should, and a wider discussion we should have uh, as an assembly about reorientating our understanding of the value that we place on our workers right across society. Re-evaluating the fact that the essential workers who are seeing us through this pandemic are the people who are often the lowest paid. And I think that when we get through this, and as we're getting through this, this is a discussion and a debate that we need to have as an assembly about the type of public services that we want, the type of economy we want, and the type of society that we want to see. Thank you, Speaker, and thank the Minister for her comments so far. Just relating to um, you referred to in your statement regarding workers and working from home, etc. Are you suffering your department, many people uh, suffering from the, the virus or illness in your department? And the home working at home has that been taken up? Thank the member for his question. Um, I'm not aware uh, that we have we have a numbers that are, are self isolating, and I'll maybe pass that over to the permanent secretary. But we are seeing a very good uptake in terms of home working. Uh, there obviously are challenges around IT uh, equipment. I don't think any of us ever. Uh, thought that we would be in this situation and be in it so quickly, um, but we are trying to meet those challenges in terms of making sure that our staff at home have the uh, essential IT equipment in order for to be able to do their job. But my view on this is very simple. Um, if, you, if you have to come to work uh, and you can't carry out your work safely, then the work should not be carried out until we can make sure that those safety mechanisms and protections are in place. And if you can work from home, then we have to do absolutely everything that we can to ensure that you can and are able to work from home. But maybe pass to the permanent secretary around staffing figures. Yeah, just to um, reassure the member that I suppose, like everybody else, we have staff in a number of categories. We have staff who are vulnerable. Um, and absolutely must stay at home. We have had, sadly, some instances of staff who have been quite gravely ill and hospitalised, but the latest information is that they are making full and good recoveries. And we have a large, a fairly significant number of staff who are required to self-isolate because of symptoms and other members of their family. So we're managing all of that. Um, we're managing it with huge goodwill and support and a commitment to public service from the 3,000 men and women who make up the department. And like everybody else, we're finding new ways of working that I suspect we'll not lose completely when we come out the other end of this. I'll get asked, can call you. And again, thank the Minister for her statement. I think it, it's um, very, very good. And to echo the previous comments in relation to all frontline workers, you know, there's such a broad uh, range of people out providing a key service here with, uh, amongst us. Um, I'd like to welcome the decision to defer water bills. The Minister will know it's an issue I have been raising, so I am pleased to hear this because um, it's something import very important um, to support our local businesses at a time when they are struggling to make a lot of these payments um, through no fault of their own. Um, so, so it is good news. I just wanted to ask then if the deferment of water bills, will it also apply to those those who have already received a bill um, since COVID has started. So if anyone has outstanding bills since the beginning of this, will theirs also be deferred? Thanks. Can I check on that and then come back to the member just to make sure that I'm giving you the absolute accurate answer? Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement today. And also, uh, I would like to pass on to all those who find themselves bereaved at this time through COVID-19. It's a difficult time. It's not a chance for them to be able to grieve properly. And thank the Minister for her kind words. Uh, the Minister has done uh, tremendous work, acting quickly and efficiently to deploy what resources her department has to support citizens and industry. As well as the COVID-19 effort, in particular, I welcome the offer of MOT centres for testing and the site for ambulance cleansing. Uh, can the Minister provide an update on what other resources have been made available and if other executive colleagues have taken on a similar support 
for the Department of Health. I thank the member um, for his question and for his very kind words. Um, in truth, I want to pay tribute to the health staff and the staff in my department um, who have worked so closely to ensure that we have seen the transformation of two of our MOT centres, uh, Belfast uh, and Newton Ards, into much needed COVID-19 uh, testing centres. In fact, uh, I was out this morning, I visited the Newton Arts um, COVID testing centre with Minister Swan, and uh, it was amazing to see it in action, uh, to see our frontline healthcare workers who have been redeployed from other uh, departments there, and the numbers of people that are going through that. I think it's uh, uh, the MOT model uh, and the COVID testing model are a perfect match for each other. Uh, we are hopeful that others will come online. And I've offered all of the MOT centres right across the north to the trusts, um, because I think it is an important aspect if we are to rapidly increase uh, testing. Uh, I think that all of us around the executive recognise that, yes, this is primarily a, a health crisis. And if we are to get through it, then we absolutely have to work together. And our primary uh, concern should be that we are doing everything that we can individually within our own departments and across departments to support our healthcare workers. Uh, also being mindful that it is now uh, an economic crisis uh, and working together to ensure that we get through this crisis, but also that we work together, that we plan together and that we make sure that we recover from it in the best possible way that we can. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I begin by echoing the sentiments expressed by Mr Durkin uh, in terms of the leadership being shown by the Minister, uh, not just her actions. In fact, not just her words. I think the tone she's deployed in her public comments um, has been very important, assured and, and reassuring. Um, my question is with regard to the impact on budget lines, because the whole executive is now uh, taking actions which were unplanned and probably unprecedented in their scale. Um, Mr Muir mentioned a figure for TransLink, which the Minister neither confirmed nor denied. I think it would be useful to know what the impact is and how you think that may play into the debate that you mentioned that follows the crisis about what sort of public transport system we want in the future. I thank the member for his very kind words. Um, there is no doubt the financial impact uh, of COVID-19 on the Department for Infrastructure uh, is hugely significant. At present, we are looking at a potential figure of £178 million. As the member, uh, Mr Moore, pointed out, uh, TransLink have gone public on this. Uh, we are talking over £100 million in terms of the impact on TransLink. We, none of us know at this moment in time certainty around the duration of this crisis, so we are as a department working through modelling in terms of the financial impact on Northern Ireland water, uh, which I touched upon in the written statement about the dramatic loss in income there, the dramatic loss in income in TransLink, the dramatic loss in income from DVA uh, in terms of the measures that we've, have, we've had to take there. And we also have to be mindful that this is coming against a backdrop where the Department for Infrastructure, for historical reasons that I don't want to, you know, I don't think it's appropriate to go into right now, members will be aware, was already in a difficult financial uh, position. So I will not dress it up. I will be honest about that. There are huge challenges, and there are huge challenges across all government departments. The COVID-19 budget allocations have not all been fully met. I'm the one department that is waiting. I think it's really important that we work together, particularly right, uh, recognising the critical importance of our wastewater infrastructure, the critical importance of having a publicly owned public transport uh, network. Um, but we shouldn't dress it up. We are facing huge financial challenges. Um, and while we welcome interventions that might come across from UK government, and we are reassured that more will be coming, it will never be enough. We are going to have to reorientate how we look at our public services, how we finance them, all of that. Uh, and that debate needs to take place. Well, Deputy Speaker, and I certainly agree with the Minister, and I would welcome that debate uh, going forward as to how our public utilities are factored in and how they could invest in the infrastructure. Can I ask the Minister, can I thank her first of all for stepping in on an individual constituent's case last week around MOT? It was greatly appreciated from me and the constituent. But that seems to be a trend, Minister, as I have received a number today uh, and yesterday on the same issue, whereby people are going to 
fulfil their test date. The MOT centres, of course, are closed, and they're not getting any documentation either before uh, turning up or after with regards to an exemption certificate. And plus, I'm hearing today that the email system may well have crashed or jammed, uh, which means then that they can't talk to the MOT centres themselves and the organisation behind that. Can the Minister shed some light on that and, and investigate it after this? Yes, the member does raise an important issue, and I am aware of this. I'm aware of it um, because of the contact from members, but also contact from members of the public, which is why I think it was at the weekend I had put a post up to explain around the TECs and tried to, to make it straightforward. It is a cumbersome process because of the lack of automation. Um, so it is difficult trying to communicate to people that you need to book a test for a centre that's closed to be able to get a temporary exemption certificate. Uh, because of the volume, um, as well, and the impact on our staff uh, in terms of social distancing and working from home. Um, it is taking much longer than we would like for hard copy uh, certificates to reach people in their homes. It is also taken, there is a bit of a delay in terms of updating the website so that people can go on and check their registration to see if a TEC has issued, which I know causes concern and people then are afraid to drive. But I want to assure members and members of the public that if you book your MOT test, you will automatically be issued with a temporary exemption certificate in our system. Um, in terms of the uh, email, the email hasn't crashed, and I had taken the email down because I suspected some members might ask. I think it's dva.customers at infrastructure-ni.gov.uk. Um, that's the central point of contact. Um, we checked today before I came down here, and I'm advised that there is no backlog in terms of that email address. But what the member might be referring to is that over the Easter weekend, the DVA website did crash. I became aware of this. Uh, and we have um, asked Capita for a full explanation as to how that happened. It did seem to be very quickly resolved, but I think it did cause um, confusion among members of the public. So aware of it, and we're taking steps to make sure that we're doing everything we can to prevent that happening again, because now more than ever, customers are reliant on communicating with us online. Uh, Gurm, I get last can call you, and I uh, want to thank the Minister and the Permanent Secretary for being present with us here today. Um, I concur with the, uh, the sentiments of colleagues across the Chamber in relation to planning. It is an issue, Minister, um, and I think that your department needs to issue some guidance to councils um, sooner rather than later because it is, it's a costly and it's a, it's a stressful exercise, and I think um, applicants need re reassurance in that regard. In terms of the, the relaxation of uh, drivers' hours, um, this was a measure taken to secure the supply lines. Um, and I understand and, and, and appreciate the reasons for that. Um, our drivers are on their front, front line, uh, making sure that our, um, our shops are, are stocked and that we have access to supplies. But I want to ask the Minister, has she uh, been engaging with the drivers and their, their representatives? They're under a lot of pressure at this time. Um, and can the Minister give us assurances that they're being supported um, to the best of her ability? Thank the, the member. Um, in terms of the council's issue, uh, my chief planner has written out to all councils and is engaging. But if there is a council that feels it's not getting sufficient support from the department, please come to me with that and we will look to see. There must be some breakdown of communication because I know my planning team have been very active on this front. On the issue of um, uh, lorry drivers and so forth, yes, we have. I have been engaging with the representative bodies. We had a very, very successful and productive teleconference um, where they were able to discuss a number of the issues. And I have to say, it has been a very, very productive working partnership. Um, the industry uh, and its representatives have been very quick at coming to us to identify difficulties, but also been very quick in coming forward with suggested solutions and also have been working with my officials very positively and proactively to resolve it. So I want to put that on record. I think for me, part of this experience it is about learning and it has reinforced to me the need to do government with people and to be informed by representatives and to have a more dynamic approach to finding solutions. Uh, and I have to say that engagement with the hauliers, representatives, with the industry, with lorry drivers ha has been very insightful for me and we've made a lot of progress by taking that approach and it's an approach that I want to maintain going forward. 
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. I love coming and talking about infrastructure, so I'm happy girl today. Um, I'd just like to thank you and your team. Um, there has been a heck of a lot of hard work um, going on through your department. People may not absolutely see that infrastructure has a key role within this pandemic, but it absolutely does. I'd also like to take the opportunity to um, pay tribute to my former colleagues in community transport who, when the tough times come along, they certainly come out and represent. Um, Minister, but I'll get back to my question. Um, a bit like my colleague um, Mike Nesbitt, MLA from Strangford, I'm concerned about the future of your department. While it's working extremely hard now and it's filling those gaps and it's providing a vital service, I am very concerned that quite often infrastructure is the poor relation when it comes to funding. And while you have a huge budget, it tends to be last down the list when key um, allocations of money is coming forward. The last thing I ever want to see is, the, is Northern Ireland Water failing to meet its standards. So I'm going to ask you just to, it's a bit like um, my colleague, Mr Andrew Muir, MLA, whenever he talked about TransLink. TransLink is our public service provider. Unlike the rest of the UK, we have a public service provider, one public service provider. They don't cherry pick. Can Northern I ask, can I ask Ms Armstrong sorry, to get to the question, please? Northern Ireland Water is in the same boat. Both of those organisations need money, and we know we have budget coming forward. What work will you be able to do to consult, to maybe bring forward the integrated transport strategy and the future of Northern Ireland Water so neither fail? I thank the member um, for her comments and for her question. If I take the community transport operators first, um, I've just been amazed and uplifted at how the community transport sector has completely stepped up, has so quickly um, repurposed its services and is playing a critical role in terms of making sure that food and medicines are going to people who are shielding and who are vulnerable. Um, it's true community spirit in action and I wouldn't expect anything less from community transport. Um, uh, genuinely, I've been very heartened by it. I also welcome her comments around infrastructure. I think infrastructure, and I've made this point since I took up the portfolio, it is often seen as bricks and mortar and cement and roads. Infrastructure is actually about connecting each one of us to critical services and to each other. It is the bedrock upon which you build a strong economy, a connected society, and how you tackle the climate emergency. I think what I have tried to do since I've taken up the portfolio is to communicate it in that way and to make people see, as I did when I took up the post, how it clearly impacts on every single aspect of our daily lives, from the moment you get up in the morning and you switch on your water tap, to how you get to and from school and work, to whether homes are built in your area, whether factories and other employment opportunities um, are able to be progressed. Uh, it all comes down to infrastructure. So I have got very passionate, much more passionate about it um, than I was before, and I'll put my hand up to that because I now realise how critically important it is to each one of us and to our futures. Like you, I share very serious concerns about the financial situation uh, facing my department. I had very serious financial concerns pre-COVID-19. Uh, those have been dramatically escalated uh, as a result. I think the first thing that we have to do as an executive and as assembly is recognise and accept the value and the importance of infrastructure and what it can do to transform lives. And then we need to work together to see how we finance that. That will require having difficult conversations, uh, but I'm up for having difficult conversations, uh, and it's something that I think that will not fall, I hope, along party lines. Maybe I'm being too optimistic uh, and hopeful, but there are difficult issues that we need to grapple with, and there are difficult issues that we must grapple with, because we are talking about the essential supply of clean drinking water. We are talking about uh, effective treatment of wastewater. We are talking about our, our public service. These are things that go to the very essence uh, of our society. So it is a conversation that I want to have with executive colleagues and with others, and I think it's something that we can find agreement on in terms of approach. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her statement today. I very much welcome the Minister's uh, approach in terms of a collaborative approach working across government. I have no time for politicians playing politics with this issue uh, at this time. It's simply not acceptable when the people out there face such threats. During uh, her statement, the Minister made reference to frontline staff, and I equally commend frontline staff within the Department of Infrastructure, uh, and you say they deserve our respect. Can I ask the Minister, in terms of potential threats that have come and intimidation of some staff, can I ask what, what steps the Minister has taken and her department has taken to pr protect those members of staff? Uh, and also, can I ask the Minister, in relation to the question, or part of the question my colleague for Strangford, the chair of the committee, asked earlier in terms of planning, 
Does the Minister intend to introduce measures to extend planning measures uh, uh, similar to those that have been applied in Scotland? Thank you. I thank the member. There is sadly a problem in terms of our frontline essential workers um, being subject to abuse from others uh, who can't understand why they are at work. Um, and it is something that I have discussed uh, with others. Uh, what I tried to do was um, be very public in terms of saying that we needed to value and to say thank you and to appreciate our frontline uh, workers. And I know executive colleagues uh, have been doing the same. I think it's very important that we reinforce the message that those who are out on our roads working are doing so because they are providing essential services to all of us. And I would encourage members uh, right across this chamber uh, to help in getting that message out there. There is no excuse for it. It should not be tolerated. And when you think about the fact that these people are going out and putting themselves at risk to keep essential services running for you or I, it's even more deplorable. Uh, but I have to say in saying that, at times like this, we see the true face of our society and why we have a small number who may be engaged in that type of behaviour. The vast majority of people have stepped up, are working to help each other uh, and are working together to get through this. I apologise to uh, Ms McElveen because I did omit to answer her question, so um, uh, thank you for giving me a second opportunity to do so. Um, I am aware that this is an issue and I am aware that legislation has been brought forward in Scotland. It will require primary legislation here, so we are exploring that as an option. The difficulty is if applicants who have um, planning permission that is imminently going to expire, the legislative option is not going to be a solution for them. One route is renewal. And granted, they have to pay a fee for that, but it is significantly reduced to the new fee. And we have been engaging with councils to say, if that is the case, please process it as quickly as possible. The other route is around the commencement of works, but again, it's not a straightforward situation. There's an, an, an amount of case law there about what will be accepted or not, so there is no straightforward answer as yet. But to assure you, we are looking at a legislative option. It just wouldn't be a timely option and that will not help a number of people who find themselves currently in this situation. That makes sense. I get the privilege, King Corlea, and I would thank the Minister for her statement as well and echo the, the comments of uh, colleagues across the Chamber in um, honouring the, the frontline workers and also extending sympathies to anybody that has a lost loved one during this crisis or because of this crisis. You wouldn't know it today, but Obviously, um, for almost the entirety of this uh, crisis, we've had a spate of good weather across the north, and that's meant that people who are furloughed or who are working from home have been taking the opportunity to exercise outdoors near their homes. And I know that the rural roads in my own locality have never seen more cyclists, walkers or runners, and obviously everyone's practising social distancing. Meanwhile, roads are seeing less car traffic, which would leave us in a situation where the few motorists who are still travelling uh, might take the opportunity to speed in areas that they normally would not, which obviously compromises road safety for all. Some measures that have been proposed to mitigate this risk include a temporary reduction of the speed limit, as well as public awareness campaigns. Meanwhile, in other countries, extra bike lanes have been put in place to allow increased space and safety for uh, cyclists could the member essential get, journeys. Get I'm the question, please. Is the Minister considering any initiatives at this time to improve road safety and potentially alleviate the pressure from an already uh, stretched health service during this coronavirus outbreak? I thank the member um, for her question. Um, we have, through the department, engaged in a uh, kind of a communication strategy around a lot of this. Um, road safety messages, also social distancing messages to those who are out walking uh, and cycling. Uh, I have been given consideration in terms of changing um, speed limits, but we have to be mindful that we have to get to the other side of this. And what I wouldn't want to do is to add further confusion to this situation. So at present, we've been very much focused on uh, putting out and raising, as you say, public uh, awareness around the issue. Uh, we will continue to do that. I will engage with the PSNI um, again after, after today to get a better understanding around the speeding problem uh, as well, to see if, what we, if we can work more collaboratively on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for coming and giving us an update today. Like lots of people, I'd like to join with her in paying tribute to the extraordinary effort and um, commitment made by people working in her department um, who are out there every morning um, delivering services for us at the front line. She will probably agree that those people um, 
will, like everyone else, want to have access to testing for COVID-19. What conversations has she had with other ministers, including the Health Minister, about the need to urgently scale up testing and contact tracing in Northern Ireland as part of managing the current um, peak, but also moving to the next stage of this crisis? And in addition to that, has she had any conversations about the possibility of bringing in outside expertise in terms of scaling up contact tracing and testing? I thank the member for his question. It is an important one. Um, I am pleased to have received assurances from the Health Minister and the Chief Medical Officer on their commitment to scaling up testing and the testing regime in Northern Ireland. And as we have um, as I've outlined, I'm very, very pleased that we're able to play our part as, in terms of a department by handing over our MOT centres to help rapidly increase uh, testing. Um, I think it's very clear, and I think all of us recognise that the evidence, the, the medical evidence, the facts lead us to the conclusion that we need to absolutely test, test, test uh, and trace. I think it's very important that we follow the medical advice uh, and that we're open to the learning on that. I'm happy to raise issues uh, that the member has, has highlighted there with my uh, executive colleagues and with the Minister uh, for Health. Um, but I think overarching to this has to be that we follow the medical evidence. Nobody has anything to be threatened by or to fear from listening to a wide range of evidence, but I also think it's really important that we continue to work together. I think that at this time of all times, there is no space or there is no justification for um, point scoring or for a them versus us approach. So I'm committed to doing what I can with executive colleagues, uh, and I'm committed to doing all that I can within my, my department to make sure that we play our part, particularly in the area of ramping up testing. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for a, a very good brief. Uh, thank you for your unstinting cooperation, especially with the Minister for Health. I'm sure he is deeply appreciative of it, as are all the people of Northern Ireland. And that type of leadership um, promotes uh, good community cohesion. Minister, my question is in relation to LGV licences. Um, and I know I've asked you about this previously, and it's to do with medicals. Um, and it became apparent to me uh, just this week that we have a, a real need to protect life. And your number one commitment here, uh, you've said, is keeping people safe is your number one commitment. I'm minded that there, we have a lot of drivers uh, who drive fire, fire plants and emergency vehicles who have regular medical assessments and they perhaps are going to fall foul of, of, of COVID-19 and all of the, the fallout from that. I'm just looking to see if you have any update for us or our commitment to even expedite and prioritise people who provide that service on the front line and indeed attain their licences. I want to reassure the member that while we are working to find a, um, a comprehensive solution to the medical assessment and licensing issue, priority is being given to those who require their licence for essential or emergency services. So if members do have uh, drivers who require that service, given the role that they play, uh, and they're not able to get that prioritised, please do flag it up with me. Undoubtedly, our, our healthcare workers are under immense uh, pressure, but I think all of us recognise that we need to be doing everything that we can to ensure that we keep our essential and our emergency services moving and available. Can I thank the Minister for her statement today and for her answers thus far. And can I echo the sentiments of all in this chamber in offering my condolences to those families who have been sadly bereaved through COVID-19 and to wish um, well all those who are fighting the virus and the, the healthcare workers who are helping those to recover from the virus. I want to pay a tribute to you, Minister, for your rock-solid leadership in the throes of this, this crisis. Well done. Um, I also want to pay tribute to your department's frontline workers in infrastructure and transport, in uh, water and wastewater uh, treatments. Those people who are out rolling up their sleeves and sharing the wheels that keep our society machine turning can keep on turning. I welcome your department's announcement today in relation to non-domestic water and wastewater charges. This will be a very welcome relief by many in the business community. Can I ask the Minister to confirm that these measures will also be available to those in the farming community who have also been very hard hit by this COVID-19 pandemic? 
Again, I thank um, the member for his very kind words. Um, yes, it will apply to farmers. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too would like to thank the Minister for her statement and for coming to the Chamber today, and also for the um, great response time that um, I have certainly got on behalf of constituents. It's very, very much appreciated. Um, I wish to ask a question about the possible allocation of road space during this pandemic, as we know there has been a great reduction in the number of cars and the roads. Would the Minister be minded to look at implementing temporary cycle and pedestrian lanes for people to use, adhering to social distancing rules, which would make it easier for people in urban areas and others to access safer um, areas for exercise, as other countries such as Mexico, the United States, Canada and EU cities as Berlin and Budapest have done? Um, I thank the member um, for her kind words in terms of um, the efficient response on constituency issues. I think it's very important that we don't lose sight in the middle of this pandemic that we are there to serve our constituents, and, and I'm very conscious of that as well. So, I want to maintain a focus on that. I do see the merits in doing that. I suppose the difficulty that we find ourselves in is that we are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we do have pressures on our own staff, and we are focusing all of our efforts in responding to and planning for COVID-19. That doesn't mean that we don't recognise the importance of the issue that you've raised. And when I spoke earlier about the need to reorientate and to do things differently um, after this crisis, not just go back to the way it was, the issues that she has touched upon are the kind of issues that I want to be very proactive uh, and look at. I think we need to look at active travel. I committed to that before this crisis. I think we need to look at reshaping um, our space and our places so that they're people-centred. Um, so it is something that I'm looking at, um, but probably in realistic terms, the ability to progress it at this time it is limited in scope, but it is something that I want to look at and continue to progress when we get to the other side of this. Uh, thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for her statement. Uh, Minister, I wanted to raise with you your response from uh, pleas from the trade unions to extend free public transport to all essential workers. I think you, you said you have no plans currently to do this. Um, uh, the move to offer public transport to health and social care workers was uh, the right thing to do and widely uh, accepted and praised, uh, but I think it is now imperative that uh, it should be extended to those in the public sector, those in retail, um, and those who are um, risking their health every day. To Ensure we have food and, and other services. And you, you, you mentioned yourself. That obviously, many of these, most of these workers are low-paid. Uh, they were disgracefully low-paid before the crisis. Uh, now their role has been elevated dramatically. Their pay is clearly inadequate, and it's evident, evident for us all to see. So, uh, I would like to ask you: Do you have any plans to review that decision around uh, extending free transport to all workers? And you rightly pay tribute to. Uh, TransLink staff. I would also ask you: Do you have any uh, plans to re review your decision around reduced uh, daytime bus services to ensure the drivers, in particular, are unnecessarily behind the wheel for long periods of time? Thank you. If I take the, the issue of reduced services, yes, there will be further reductions in services while maintaining that um, essential routes to make sure that our health care workers and essential workers so can get to and from their places of work. So we're doing a piece of analysis there, but there will be further reduction in, in services. Um, the member raises an issue that I have been grappling with because I absolutely recognise uh, and appreciate the role of essential workers. What I'm trying to weigh up is the practicalities of rolling that extension out, because for it to practically operate, it would mean offering free transport to everyone. It would be very difficult. It actually would be impossible to be able to categorise workers. What I'm currently considering is the unintended consequences of actually incentivising use of public transport across Northern Ireland as we continue in, in the lockdown, because people would perhaps want to avail and be incentivised to come out to use public transport because it's free. So I do want to assure the member it is something in principle that I would be very supportive of, but as a minister I have to think through the intended and unintended consequences of my actions, but I am keeping the situation under review. I thank the Minister for her statement and the answers to, her quest, to the questions. In accordance with precedent that was established at the first meeting of this committee, we have around nine minutes left. So if any members have any pressing questions that they wish to ask the Minister, uh, if they could indicate to me by rising in their place. Um, if not, then I think we can set the Minister free. 
No further questions? They were, the answers were comprehensive, uh, Minister, so congratulations. Uh, that concludes questions uh, on the statement. Uh, we will now have a brief suspension of 10 minutes uh, prior to the next statement from the Minister for Education. I remind members around the rules about social distancing, please use the door nearest to you when exiting the chamber. Thank you. This is the Northern Order. Ireland Assembly Plenary. Order. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Order, members. Agenda item three is a statement from the Minister of Education. The Speaker's office received notification on the 15th of April that the Minister wished to make a statement to the ad hoc committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to deliver is included in your pack at page 18. I would like to welcome the Minister uh, of Education to this, com this committee meeting. I invite the Minister to make his statement, which should be heard by members without interruption. Following the statement, there will then be an opportunity for members to ask questions. I call the Minister for Education, Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. And perhaps I should start by uh, also passing on my condolences to other members of the House as those who have lost their lives in recent days with the, this terrible virus. I welcome the opportunity to update members on decisions I have taken to ensure that young people in Northern Ireland uh, who were due to complete their GCSEs, their AAS and A-level qualifications this summer uh, will be awarded grades that will enable them to move on to the next stage of their lives. On the 19th of March, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister uh, announced a, a radical package of measures that the Executive was taking to deal with the unprecedented challenges facing our society as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. Amongst many other things, that included the closure of schools from Friday the 20th of March for an unspecified period of time, something which uh, in and of itself is unprecedented. With schools closed and young people unable to complete all of their work required for this year's public examination series, it was vitally important uh, that there was consideration on how to best provide certainty to the system, and particularly for those entered with examinations, as soon as practically possible. I am very aware of the importance of the, these exams for the futures of the young people who have been working so hard towards them. However, it was clear from the point at which the decision to close schools was made that it would be very unlikely that the examinations could take place as scheduled. Therefore, following engagement with and in line with ministerial colleagues in England and Wales, I announced on the 19th of March that GCSEs, AS and A-level examinations would not uh, proceed. My priority from that point on was to ensure that we had put in place a robust process that would provide the young people affected uh, with fair and uh, equitable results. Those results should reflect their hard work and effort. Equally, this should enable them to make judgments and decisions about the next stage in their education, training and employment. It is important, and I am sure everyone will agree, that the 2020 cohort of students are also not disadvantaged in comparison with those who went before them or those who will come after them. Over the past few weeks, my officials have been working with uh, CCEA to develop a process that has fairness at its core. Fairness to the young people whose lives will be impacted by the current circumstances. Fairness to teachers um, who, who have supported those young people along their journey and share their joys and disappointments. And fairness to the families of those young people who are undoubtedly anxious about the potential impact the situation may have on their children's future. The Department has received a number of queries from pupils, parents, uh, teachers, all anxious to know what, would, uh, what will happen. Today, I am providing that certainty uh, they seek about the process for awarding A -A -level, AS level and GCSE qualifications. Uh, I am also mindful that there are many young people in schools uh, who have, have been able to um, access a wide range of vocational qualifications through the entitlement framework, and they too are seeking certainty. While I cannot provide that certainty today, I, I can assure members that we are working closely with officials in the Department of the Economy who have. Um, who have led on vocational qualifications policy. And collectively, we are very aware of the need to ensure that young people taking those qualifications are likewise not disadvantaged. The Minister of the, of the Economy for the Economy will provide clarity in relation to those qualifications uh, in the next few weeks. I have, detailed, I have a detailed paper from CCEA setting out a series of options for each of the qualifications under consideration. CCEA had undertaken an option appraisal including testing each of the options 
and based against four criteria. Fairness, uh, reduction in the burden, impact uh, uh, limitation and minimising uncertainty. The advice was carefully considered by myself, my officials and subsequently tested with advisers in the Education and Training Inspectorate. As part of the process to develop proposals that would have confidence uh, of the education system, my officials uh, consulted with representatives of head teachers and teacher, uh, teaching unions, as well as other educational stakeholders. And I want to thank those organisations for their constructive engagement in these difficult circumstances. I have taken their views into account in arriving at my decisions. Uh, I am therefore hopeful that the decisions uh, I will take, while well, I am sure not everybody will agree with everything, uh, will continue to have the support of the education system. Everyone recognises that there is no perfect uh, solution, but I am confident that we now have a process which will lead to our young people being awarded the results uh, they merit and which will enable them to progress to the next stage of their lives, whether it be on to a further level of education, training or into the world of work. Teachers in particular will have a key role, and I will be coming to the detail of this in a minute, will have a key role to play in relation to the alternative form of assessment. This, I believe, is the right approach to take. Who knows better the aptitudes, abilities, educational achievements of these young people uh, than their teachers, who have guided them through the past few years on their uh, educational journey? I want to pay tribute to all our teachers uh, for the way that they have adapted to the current circumstances and are making every effort to ensure that teaching and learning continues as best as possible. And again, I would like to thank them in advance for helping implement the arrangements that we are now putting in place for awarding qualifications to ensure uh, their students are able to progress. Now, in Northern Ireland, we have an open qualifications market, which means that learners can choose qualifications offered by a range of examination bodies across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. GCSE and A-levels are also brands operated on a three-country basis. Scotland is in a slightly different position. Uh, therefore, it is important uh, to ensure continued comparability and portability of these qualifications, uh, that we are aligned with the arrangements in England and Wales as far as possible, while recognising that the approach also needs to reflect uh, policy differences. I believe the decisions taken uh, provide for the appropriate alignment while also being in the best interests of young people in Northern Ireland. While 98 per cent of young people in Northern Ireland uh, schools take the CCEA, GCSEs, and 87 per cent take CCEA A-levels, a small number of, uh, take qualifications offered by English and Welsh examining boards. Those qualifications will be subject to the arrangements in their respective jurisdictions. Both Ofqual and Qualification Wales have published guidance on their websites setting out the uh, relevant arrangements. In relation to qualifications offered by CCEA, which are taken by the vast majority of students, I can confirm I have now instructed CCEA as follows. Young people due to complete their, uh, their full GCSE, AS and A-level qualifications will be issued a set of results this summer in order to allow them to progress uh, further, further study or employment. For those young people uh, due to take part in part of a, a GCSE qualification, uh, I suppose known as a GCSE model, uh, module, unit level results uh, will not be provided. So, In relation to the four main general public examination series, I will cover each in turn, starting with A-levels. For those students due to complete an A-level this year, and in the absence of examinations, they will receive a calculated grade based on a combination of teacher professional judgment, which includes grading and rank ordering by schools, and uh, proven statistical modelling. They will also include this statistical modelling will also include a value added element to take account of the impact uh, resets would normally have had on the final A-level uh, outcomes. Those are resets which have already taken place in terms of AS levels. Students will not be required to take A-level examinations through an additional sitting, such as in an autumn series. But if they wish to sit examinations, there is the opportunity in the summer of 2021 for, uh, for those people to do uh, effectively a form of reset. In relation to AS levels, AS qualifications uh, are not only standalone qualifications, but also contribute in Northern Ireland to A-level qualifications uh, when combined with what is known as the A2 exams. For this year, the AS level in 2020 will be decoupled from the A2 A level. Uh, so, for those due to complete an AS level, they will also receive a calculated grade. 
However, that calculated grade will not uh, contribute towards the wording of an A-level in the summer of 2021. Uh, the AS grade by, in 2020 will be calculated using a combination of the uh, teacher professional judgment, again involving grading and rank ordering by schools, and also pupil prior performance, including the GCSE mean scores. And for those who are then progressing on, for students in summer of 2021, students who continue on to the A2 will have two options. Uh, they can either choose to sit only the relevant A2 papers in summer 2021, and therefore an A-level will be awarded based on those papers, with the AS component being treated as a missing paper. Uh, the marks will be retrospectively calculated using recognised statistical uh, modelling. The process is one normally used when, for example, if a student is unable to sit a paper due to illness or some sort of unforeseen circumstances. So it is something that has been used um, in the past. Uh, alternatively, a student may choose to sit both the AS and A2 papers to achieve an overall A-level grade. In this case, the AS component will be calculated using statistical modelling, uh, as in the, the first option. Very importantly, I wanted to make it clear that the overall A-level uh, will be awarded on the basis of the higher marks from these two options uh, in terms of the AS component, either the actual performance in the paper or the calculated mark. In relation to those com uh, completing components for the GCSE qualifications, those young people due to complete GCS qualifications in 2020, and generally speaking we're talking about year 12 pupils, will receive a calculated grade based on a combination of teacher professional judgment, again including grading and rank ordering by schools, and the average centre performance over the past three uh, summer series. Finally, in relation to GCS units, uh, which are otherwise known as modules, GCSEs in Northern Ireland are modular and so enable uh, students to take exams for units making up their full, the full qualification at different times over the two-year uh, course of study. Some continue to take all units at the end of the second year, but there are many Year 11 students who are due to take a number of units this year. For those students taking units that will not lead to the completion of a GCS qualification this year, there will be no grades issued uh, or be awarded this year. These learners will participate in the summer uh, 2021 series and for each GCSE, they will have the following options. Those learners not entered for any modules in a, in a given GCSE in summer 2020 uh, should aim to sit as originally planned the elements of the relevant GCSE in the next academic year, which could include units taken in November, January or March as part of the normal 2021 examination series. Those learners entered for a, a part of a GCSE in 2020, but not due to complete uh, the qualification will have two options in the next academic year. Either they will choose to uh, sit only the outstanding units of their qualification, with the remaining units being treated as missed papers and marks being calculated on the units taken in 2021, again using that recognised statistical modelling to arrive at an overall calculated grade, or alternatively students may choose to sit all units of their GCSE qualifications in the normal 2021 examination timetable. Calculated marks for the units for which they are entered in summer 2020 will also be generated, and again it will be the higher mark achieved for those units, either the calculated mark or the actual performance, will be used to arrive at the overall GCSE grade. Now, I appreciate uh, this, and it's all very complex, and uh, members may, may realise it took quite a long time to be able to uh, uh, absorb all this my, myself over the, the last period, um, and it's also quite technical in nature. But CCEA will be providing more detailed advice and guidance to schools, parents and young people as a matter of urgency, and have also published answers to frequently answered questions on the CCEA website. In all the discussion of these options, I was conscious to keep learners at the centre of any solution. I believe the, the solutions I've outlined does just that. It provides flexible options where possible to ensure learners, particularly those in years 11 and 13, are not overburdened. Uh, nevertheless, they do have the option of sitting exams for all the parts of their qualifications if they so choose. As I've said earlier, teachers are a crucial part of this process. We will be relying on teachers uh, for the information needed to arrive at calculated grades. Schools have a wealth of information uh, to evidence the achievements of their students, including demonstrating progress over the current academic year. And I'm confident that they'll be able to work with CCEA to provide the students with fair and robust results. And again, I want to thank every teacher for their support in this process. So what are the next steps that needs to be taken? 
Firstly, uh, CCA will be issuing detailed guidance to, to schools, parents and young people, um, highlighting the arrangements that I have just outlined. They will include more detail on the information schools will have to provide to begin the process of collating the relevant information at the end of May. CCEA will also provide advice and support for teachers as required. CCEA are also developing uh, an appeals mechanism which will be as robust as possible. While it is not possible to review marking in the normal way, it is nonetheless important that young people are able to appeal if they feel the process has not been appropriately applied in their case. CCEA will take into account the steps of Qual and Qualification Wales are also taking in developing an appeals mechanism. And as with normal processes, there will also be an opportunity for students to take examinations in summer uh, 2021 uh, should they wish to. There are a number of other issues which need to be finalised and work is continuing apace. For example, I will be considering a number of matters relating to data collection, an issue which is likely to be handled at a UK level to ensure consistency of approach. In any examination process, confidentiality is paramount in producing robust and reliable outcomes. This process requires teachers to maintain that confidentiality and they cannot share examination assessments with parents or pupils in advance of submitting uh, those assessments to CCEA. Parents and pupils should not ask, nor should they expect, to receive this information. Teachers have a complex task ahead of them, and they must be offered the opportunity to assess pupil performance objectively and holistically. Another issue I think, uh, where work is ongoing is in relation to private candidates. Those are students who have not been taught in school because uh, they might be homeschooled following distance learning uh, programmes or be studying independently. Now, where, where a school has, or indeed a centre, has accepted entries from private candidates, and that would quite often be particularly for adults doing um, GCSEs or A-levels, uh, those students should be included in the data provided by the school where the head of centre, generally speaking the principal, is confident that they and their staff have had sufficient evidence uh, to of the young person's achievement to make an objective uh, judgment. CCEA are currently exploring uh, whether there are alternative options for the small number of students who do not have an existing relationship with the school. Uh, and it may not be, being honest in this, be possible to find an acceptable solution for every uh, private uh, candidate. Finally, I'm confident that the results in England, Wales and Northern Ireland will issue on the original published dates. Uh, therefore, AS and A-level results will issue on the 13th of August, and GCSE results will issue on the 20th of August. And it was important that the results issue on the three jurisdictions at the same time, so that no one was placed in a particular either advantage or disadvantage. The proposals I have outlined uh, should provide schools, teachers, young people, and their families with the clarity they have been calling for in relation to qualifications. I hope they will show, uh, this will also show that fairness is at the heart of the approach I have adopted and that our young people can be assured that the grades that they will receive will reflect the work that they have put in over recent years. Extraordinary circumstances have necessitated the introduction of, of new arrangements to replace these examinations, uh, which have been used over many years. But I am confident that the measures that we have announced today uh, will enable our young people to continue on their journey throughout, uh, through life despite the disruption created by the COVID-19 outbreak. I thank the Minister for his statement. I will now invite members to question the Minister on the content of his statement. I have 19 members listed who wish to ask a question. So again, folks, it's important that the questions are focused and directly related to the content of the Minister's statement. The one person in this debate who will get a bit of leeway on that is the Chair of the Education Committee, Mr Chris Little. I call Mr Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I too thank the teachers, parents and pupils of Northern Ireland for the positive way in which they are responding to this public health emergency. Their sacrifice and compliance with social isolation and social distancing is literally saving lives, and we ask them to keep going. Can I thank the Minister for his work on this challenging matter? The Minister has decided that grades will be based on a combination of teacher judgment, rank order of school, statistical modelling and a reset factor. My first question is what exactly is meant by the rank order of school? The Minister also says that grading will reflect the work pupils have put in over recent years. 
This obviously cannot reflect the work pupils would have done in preparation for exams. So my second question is why the option of rescheduling examinations has been discounted on this occasion. I thank the, the member for his comments. Um, the member might have slightly picked me up a, wrong in terms of rank order. Rank order within a school, so that if you are ranking sort of um, a certain number of pupils uh, on a particular subject, that they are ranked. Uh, that is because we have to take account there will also be within this the statistical modelling a certain level of indication of um, call it sort of centre assessment, uh, because if if the principal driver. Um, while we're trying to use as much statistics as possible, if the principal driver is the teacher performance, uh, there's got to be some degree of cognizance that uh, while there will be very detailed guidance, and it's not simply a predicted grade, uh, that will be given by CCEA to schools. Uh, some, it is human nature that um, some schools may, uh, shall we say, treat their, their, uh, their particular cohort of, of pupils either very strictly or more generously than others. So there's got to be some level of adjustment within that. And therefore, if you like, the rank order becomes because uh, the grades that will be, while probably the biggest single influence in this will be the teacher uh, assessment, um, the grade that, that they would predict and award notionally for their, their people may not necessarily be the, the end grade. So that's why that has to be put in, in place. Um, in terms of the, um, the other issue that, uh, that the member raised, um, oh yes, in terms of uh, broad sort of the Preparation. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, rescheduling. Yes, this was a matter that was looked at, and I think there was a couple of issues in, in relation to that. Uh, there is obviously an appeals mechanism. Uh, if, given the fact that probably of, of principal value, uh, the issue of resets will have most direct relevance to a university place. In one sense, first of all, if we were having a full reset, you would have to have it right across the board on everything available. That would create a considerable level of additional cost and complexity to the, the system, but also by the time that you're able to produce resets, it would be past the post for anybody that would be, for example, applying to a university. So there will be the opportunity for directly for a reset if anybody wants it as the normal process in the summer of 2021, but there was a very limited value that would be provided by a reset um, in, the, uh, in the autumn. To some extent, um, one of the, I think one of the other drivers is um, there is, an, an, uh, obviously, members will see the complexity of the arrangements that have had to be put in place. To some extent, the, the position in Northern Ireland, particularly around A levels, um, is that we have much more of a statistical data base than would apply in England, because there's no progression directly in England um, as part of the overall process from, from AS to, to A level. That means we're able to use the AS um, information, which can be then used in statistic modelling. Whereas, for instance, in England, they are purely having to base this really on teacher assessment. So there is an argument that, that we're producing uh, a more complex and the more data-driven bit. So that also, I think, necessitated a certain level of uh, need for, for resets. But effectively, there is the safety net on two grounds. There's the appeals process, which will look towards uh, whether the process has been applied correctly. And there's ultimately the, the position of the summer exams from 2021. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his comprehensive statement to the House this afternoon on this very important issue. Can I also thank the Minister as well for his uh, time and commitment in the most difficult of circumstances uh, over the last number of weeks. Minister, this is vitally important for the young people, their parents and their teachers, and I would take this opportunity on behalf of my party to thank the principals, teachers and all in the education family for their hard work and the responsible attitude they have adopted over the last number of weeks. Can I ask you, how will the appeals be considered? Uh, will this be done by the Department of Education or CCEA? And because these issues are so complicated and complex, as you've set out in your statement, how will this be communicated to the learners and their families and their teachers? Well, I think in terms of the detail um, of the communication, that will be through CCEA whenever the detailed guidance is there. Uh, the issue, I think, is that in terms of at least uh, the initial stage of what's being announced today will be, I think, is being shared by CCEA directly to schools more or less as we speak on that basis. Um, specifically as regards to the appeals, the appeals process will be organised by CCA to, to ensure that, that we have a robust system to check process around individual marking. Um, that process in terms of appeals will, will largely speaking be agreed to try to be aligned as much as possible with England and Wales, that we get a comprehensive system. Um, it is the case that, that it is important that both there is comparability and portability. 
uh, but also that our students, by way of process of appeal, uh, are not disadvantaged in any way. That means, that, therefore, there has to be an appeal mechanism for them, but also in ensuring that appeal mechanism mirrors what is there elsewhere. Because if we had, for example, a more generous appeal system than other jurisdictions, then that might call into question when universities were awarding places they may say, well, actually, they've only got that grade because of a particular process. So that's why the work that is going on in terms of drilling down into the detail of the appeal process uh, will not just involve CCA, but CCA working closely with Ofqual, who are the overall um, examinations qualification board for the, the United Kingdom as a whole. Melgood, last can corner. Minister, thank you for your statement and uh, providing clarity on summer examination arrangements. I also would like to thank teachers and unions um, who have been supporting you in this work. Minister, you'll be aware particularly of the issue around the levels of attainment achieved by working class boys and some others. This group of students would not have had access to the level of extra tuition that some of their peers would have had throughout the year. Has there been consideration given as to how we can reduce the extent to which these students may be disadvantaged in terms of results and the admissions process? That's why it's, it's vital in terms of attainment levels. Uh, and the member will, will note the thing that in each of the areas where grades are going to be awarded, be it at A level, AS level, or GCSE, that yes, while well, we've got statistical data which will help, if you like, refine that. That a lot of this will be on the basis of um, also a degree of teacher judgment, teacher indication, who will know the, the pupils. And they will know, um, for want of a better word, where a, a student has got ability, but may not have been given the same level of advantages. So there is a, an opportunity, if you like, to trust, if you like, in the individual assessment of, of teachers to be able to provide that. And I think that that should provide um, some level of balance uh, in terms of producing the, the end results. Can I thank the Minister for his statement and for his answers thus far. And can I pay a tribute to teachers, principals, pupils, parents and all involved in education who have completely had to reconstitute their roles in a different, uh, entirely different education environment. Um, speaking with a principal in a major school in Armagh earlier today, and um, Armagh City, our centre of, of education for centuries, for many centuries, and he has expressed concerns about the impact of this, your proposals on those who are from a different socio-economic background in terms of not having access to IT, to computers, to uh, broadband even, and how they may be disadvantaged through this uh, particular uh, solution, which is, we're in uncharted territories, I recognise, but does the solution mean that some, socio some from a specific socio-economic background will be disadvantaged? And can you clarify what you mean by um, established statistical, or recognised statistical model? Thank you very well, much, Minister. Um, uh, yeah, I can deal with, I suppose, it, the latter point in terms of the statistical model. It's a technical device known as Z-scores, which, um, in, terms of, in terms of that, has been the, the modelling which has been used um, and this is effectively writ large, of where every year there will be a, a certain number of pupils who, uh, for reasons outside of their control, are not able to actually uh, participate in the examination. Now, it might be because of illness. It might be, for example, on the eve of an exam, they've had a, a family bereavement and aren't able to. So every year there, there has been, through CCA, a number, a cohort of pupils who, at various levels, have missed uh, a component of their exams. And this, if you like, enables through analysis of past performance then to be able to uh, calculate out and effectively replace that, that missing element uh, within that. He mentions about the concern. I, mean, I know um, the values of Armagh, as, as someone who comes, um, lives in Bangor, I mean, com compete for the land of saint and scholars in terms of uh, the, the great background of those, of those two great uh, places. Uh, but to some extent, he mentions, and I, I think it, it comes back to the point that was made um, earlier to... Uh, Karen Mullen. Uh, driver at, at the heart of this will be adjustments that are there from the statistics, but the teacher assessment will be absolutely critical to all elements of this. Teachers are in a good position, therefore, to be able to evaluate on the basis of um, trying to take into account the socio-economic backgrounds of, of children, indeed the levels of attainment. Uh, and obviously, one of the concerns at the moment uh, will be um, that the extent to which um, uh, some pupils will have been denied in the last few weeks um, 
for example, sort of maybe that they won't have the same amount of opportunities as each other. Uh, to some extent, because any of the statistics are based on largely historic and indeed uh, what has happened up until now, to some extent, if you like, the problems of the last few weeks will not actually then act as any degree of detriment to anybody. And indeed, there may be an argument that, um, that in terms of coaching, because coaching is quite often for the purposes of an examination, that it may actually be that this creates, uh, while I think all of us want to see as much a return to normal as possible, there, there may be an argument that this actually creates a slightly level, more level playing field than would actually necessarily happen uh, through examinations. Mr. I thank him for his statement, first of all. Can I ask him, with regards to the, the teachers' assessments, will these be over a specific period of time, or will that be left to the teachers? And if it is left to the teachers, how can the Minister then ensure a level playing field right across the country? With detailed guidance, in terms of that, there will be, in many ways, the teachers will have to make a certain level of holistic view. Uh, obviously, there will, there will be elements, particularly in regards to the A-level side of it, where there's data which can then be, be used very specifically. And so, therefore, the level of the data will be the driver um, on each of the, the elements of this. Uh, but in terms of the detailed guidance of um, how schools are to collect data, how they're to format that and use that, how they're to make those assessments, uh, CCA will be giving detailed guidance uh, to them so that no school should be in the dark over what actions that they need to take. Minister, thank you for your statement. Given the unprecedented times we are in, we have had to make decisions and policy changes very quickly and without the level of consultation which we would usually insist on. Can I ask, has there been any international examples of best practice in regard to the provision of exams that may have informed your approach to this issue? Well, CCA, I think, have, have examined all the evidence. Um, she mentions rightly, and I think part of the problem I think we're all facing on a range of things, that policy issues which normally would take months and they would be mulled over for years would be deeply consulted upon, at times are having to be made in weeks, in days, sometimes even in hours. So there is that, that element of it. I think in terms of what we've tried to do in terms of consultation on this is to go, for instance, particularly to the main teaching unions. We've had lengthy sessions um, with them and with a range of other educational stakeholders, such as the Education Authority, such as CCMS, for example, uh, such as ETI, uh, to effectively then highlight what potentially was getting proposed, to make sort of adjustments where, and I think, to be fair, the responses we were getting back was perhaps where there were some concerns there was a little bit of adjustments needed. Nobody felt the direction of travel was in the wrong direction. And in terms of balancing out the consultation that, that was taking place, I suppose one criticism uh, that has been there has been that England, for instance, has been able to announce largely a week or two ago. We took a little bit longer because we wanted to make sure as much as possible we would have something that was fit for purpose and we could bring people along. But also, I suppose, um, again, in the English situation, particularly as regards A-levels, because they had that entire sort of decoupling of the AS levels, uh, that option, if you like, of using some level of, of data-driven element of it wasn't there in England, so I suppose they were left largely with one choice. It's very easy to make a decision if you've only got one choice that, that, that can be made. So yes, it, it has been actually looking at all those. I, I should also indicate, which I think I mentioned briefly in the statement, in, in arriving at this position, for each of the four cohorts uh, and each of the four elements, there were options, a range of options developed um, for all four of them. They were all assessed against those key criteria, and it was the option which then overall produced, produced the best possible outcome, judged against that, that was the, the selected uh, outcome. So this has all been very carefully thought, thought through, and the advice of others has been taken into account fully with that. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, my question relates to A2 students finishing this year. Will there be any disadvantage to any students from Northern Ireland going to apply for universities in their uh, lower parts of the United Kingdom? No, I mean, again, what we've, we've worked on in terms of those who are completing degrees, um, first of all, I think universities have um, accepted that, um, that, if you like, the, the methodologies that are being, being used will be ones that, that will be recognised by, by universities. It is important uh, that the process that we're doing is, um, while there are some particularly known nuances, we are in a, probably in a position that's very akin to Wales and a very similar approach to Wales. England is slightly different, 
but we don't envisage there be any level of disadvantages for anybody um, seeking those, those positions. And it was also important, which was something uh, myself and indeed particularly the, the Welsh Government was pressing on, to try to ensure then that um, as much and as, regular, as regulated as possible that all the results came out at the same time. And I think it's only been, I think, today where there's been that, that full agreement that we will see a situation in which exams on the A-levels will be on the 13th of August and indeed similarly with other, other exams as well, which means that when it comes to competing for university places, as much as possible, everybody should be on a level playing field. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his statement today. And I, I, I just want to echo your, your um, heart for the, the, the families who are bereaved recently through this pandemic. And, and you've, you've said in your statement, and you've said uh, repeatedly in the Education Committee, that this is going to be people focused. And I, and I thank you for that. Um, you had said that there had been a, a consultative process with the, the teaching unions. And in looking through the, the, the potential difficulties that may arise from this process. Um, one of the things that, that can often raise its head is the pressure that is put on teachers. Um, and uh, the teachers are now going to have something thrust upon them uh, in terms of these predictive, predicted grades. Um, so with regard to the consultation with the teaching unions, can you outline to us today if the teaching unions raised any concerns with regard to the pressures that teachers... Yeah, I mean, across the board, um, we had... There were a number of meetings that were held um, with different groups, including particularly the teacher unions. Yes, there were issues of general concerns that were raised. There were issues of nuances that, that we've tried to build into these. Again, I don't think there was any particular disagreement with the, the general direction of travel and indeed the, the route that we've, we've done. It is important, uh, and one of the concerns will be there to try to protect teachers, both in terms of their workload and I think inevitably this will involve a certain amount of additional additional work, but also, as we've indicated, and indeed there is provision, um, I think, uh, under the, the regulations to ensure that there will be confidentiality built into the grades that they are giving, at least up until that point. Uh, the issue around sort of data protection is one that will be is being looked at on a UK-wide basis, because again, we want to make sure that this is a, as uh, as robust a process as, as process and one that is. Uh, that any form of either malpractice or any level of, of outside pressure that, that can be sustained as, as, as much as possible. Uh, last pre and I want to thank the Minister uh, for his statement and also to express our condolences to all those who have died in the hospital settings or in the care settings from, from this dreadly, uh, deadly virus of COVID-19. Uh, Minister, I was listening to intently to what you said around the students of 2020 not being disadvantaged and um, them having to move on with their lives and then to some of the colleagues you had answered around the university settings. I think there's going to be more of a demand on our university, our local university settings from students because of everything that has happened. So I would like to ask you about the kind of collaboration and work that's going on. You had mentioned the Minister of the Economy, because I think it's going to be crucially important uh, for yourselves to be working together for those students so that they're not disadvantaged. And you'll not be surprised that Karen Mullen and I were primarily focusing a lot on McGee University. And we're, we're looking at the medical school at this moment in time. God knows we need it now more than ever. And we also have an excellent facility there for, for nursing students as well. So for the students of 2020 that you spoke about to make sure that they're not discriminated or disadvantaged, then it would be good to get us uh, an understanding of the kind of work that's going on between the two ministers. In terms of university places, that is something that the economy has a lead on. So therefore, the more detailed work, um, and it's also something that will have to be on a cross-jurisdictional basis um, in connection with that. Um, obviously, I appreciate there are particular issues around McGee, which largely speaking, particularly, there will also be work between uh, the economy minister and the health minister on. I suppose in particular, I suppose the fact that all students in 2020 are in a similar position, but where we've got to go, and, and uh, I mentioned about one of the criteria being impact, limiting uh, the impact. Part of that is actually to ensure that, therefore, that in terms of the knock-on impact on students from 2020, that that is kept to a minimum. That, for example, not just in terms of the university places, because 
for the most part, those who are competing for university places in uh, autumn of, of, of 2020 will all, largely speaking, be from the same cohort. But the issue, particularly on the jobs market, if we move in the years ahead, that um, somebody who has who's left school in 2020 is not seen as the poor relation. That's why I think we want to ensure that what was there was robust as possible and that it also didn't leave people having to do some level of catch-up. I mean, I think inevitably it is difficult to take uh, any level of action without some level of forward impact. Uh, and I think that that will be the case of, of, of many aspects of this. But we want to, one of the criteria, well, fairness is probably the overriding impact uh, issue on it, in terms of those four criteria that we, we try to uh, protect the cohort of 2020 as much as possible uh, with that. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister um, for coming and giving us an update. Um, I too would like to echo his words in relation to teachers uh, who have been very flexible um, and, and shown real leadership uh, during the course of this crisis. Um, as for, further to some of the previous questions, I do want to ask him about um, conversations his department have had with UCAS in relation to unconditional offers. Um, others have asked about this, and I know university, man, you know university policy sits and HE policy sits with the Department of Economy, but clearly this needs to be joined up. I understand UCAS have extended the moratorium on unconditional offers. Um, how, is, how is his department engaged with UCAS in terms of managing that process, and how will that be communicated in a joined up way to students who will be looking at this and thinking, well, what does this mean for me in terms of how I interact with UCAS? Uh, it's important that, I mean, and again, the principal point of contact with UCAS is through my colleague, um, the Department of the Economy, that basis. What is important, uh, and I think where UCAS have a critical role to play, um, is that we don't want to see the universities um, have a sort of a competitive race against each other, a, a danger almost a race to the bottom of just wanting to suck in as many students as they possibly can. I mean, one of the areas that there is a, a worry across the board in terms of universities I think is that they will have difficulty filling spaces in 2020, both in terms of the fact that, that uh, one of the impacts may well be a damaging of the international market, but also actually that uh, because there may be a general perception, certainly in, uh, across the world and certainly within uh, the UK, within the Republic, that in some way maybe this is best holding off for a year, that'll, that there will be a higher proportion of, of students wanting to defer and not, and not do that. There is therefore, I think, a degree of danger um, that, uh, that universities try to act unilaterally. And I think that UCAS is, the, is probably the key body which is trying to hold those, those together. There is a, a, a wider conversation, I think, to be held about what level of support can be there from, from universities. Because if they, as I said, if they feel that economically they could be in very great difficulties next year because of that, uh, again, in terms of the wider context of that, that's got to be something which is done not just on an Northern Ireland wide basis, but across jurisdictional basis. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I want to return to, to this idea that teachers are going to play a key role in, in this alternative form uh, of assessment. The Minister said, and I quote, this is, I believe, the right approach to take. Who knows better the aptitudes, abilities and educational achievements of these young people? If, if memory serves, when this regime was proposed as an alternative to an 11-plus style exam, in choosing pupils post-primary school. Teachers were dead set against that proposal. So my question is, are teachers entirely comfortable with this? And does it set a precedent of some sort? Well, uh, to be fair, it's normally John O'Dowd raises the 11 plus. Uh, I don't know if, if, if the member from Strangford is acting as, as sort of a proxy in relation to that. No, look, I don't think this sets a precedent for anything. Um, it is undoubtedly the case. I think there has been consultation and work with the teacher unions I think for all of us, I think we'd accept that, that not only is this not the perfect solution, it is not something that would be put in place in normal times on that basis. But it's clear that the principal driver, I think, in terms of that, that level of knowledge are teachers in, on that basis. Uh, you know, I think this is actually a bespoke solution that is trying to deal with the overwhelmingly different set of circumstances that we are facing uh, following the, the coronavirus. And therefore, I wouldn't like to see, and I don't think it is right to see, read across into other, other situations. It's about trying to provide the best possible solutions in incredibly difficult uh, circumstances. So uh, by all means, I think in terms of at some stage, I'm sure this House will have various debates during this term in terms of what is done about post-primary uh, transfer and 
uh, we may all take our different positions in relation to that. I, this is obviously principally focused in on those students from year 11 to 14 and the particular solutions which are required to get us what, what we hope is a unique year. We hope this is not something uh, which will have to be re revisited next year or the year after. We hope that uh, we are into brighter times by that particular stage. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I uh, thank um, the Minister for his statement and, and, and welcome his attendance here today. Uh, Minister, you had touched upon it in your statement and in your comments, hence, uh, on England and Wales. Uh, is this model that you have outlined today consistent in approach to the model which has been adopted in other places within the UK? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, obviously, whenever the focus in, and, and again, um, Probably with respect to them, Scotland's in a slightly different position because they have hires, they have different uh, ages whenever they're, they're, uh, they are reaching that particular point, and effectively their university students start uh, more or less a year earlier. Um, it is about something which is there has been close work by CCA with Ofqual. Now we are in a different position in Northern Ireland, particularly as regards to A levels, and particularly because of the data that is able to be produced. Uh, the major contrast, I think, is on the basis of the connection between AS results and A levels. Whereas in England there is no relationship at all between the two. Um, so to that extent, it is about getting something that is fit for purpose for Northern Ireland, but trying to get as much compatibility as, as possible. I would say that we are, uh, from that point of view, England is in a slightly different position from the rest of the UK. Ourselves in Wales are, this is a very similar sort of uh, approach that's been adopted and a similar position between uh, those jurisdictions. But I think all three are largely compatible, at least with each other, and there's portability in terms of the exam results uh, with those, those organisations. It should also be indicated that, as I mentioned, there will be a minority of students um, whose grades will come through boards that are based in either in England and Wales, and that will be governed, if you like, by the regulations that are, that are there. Margaret Preeve, last thing, Corlean. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And could I also thank the Minister for his uh, statement? But I just want to go back to the appeals process. Um, in terms of obviously we, we could see a high volume of appeals, but Minister, is, is there an independent oversight uh, on what would that look like? And could you just define exactly what the process is now typically and normally, plus uh, against what will come forward? The position is that the appeals process, um, there will be more work needed to be done on that because we want to make sure that the appeals process is compatible with what is happening elsewhere. As I said um, earlier, it is about ensuring that our students are not put at a level of disadvantage by having something which is radically different from what happens uh, elsewhere. And indeed, in one sense, as I said, if we had a more generous position as regards appeals, that is something which could potentially be seen to be counted against our pupils because it may be regarded, if you like, that they had an easier route. Uh, so that will be something which doesn't entirely stand alone within Northern Ireland. There will have to be work with CCEA or continuing work with Ofqual to develop that for the autumn. It will be largely speaking though, based upon uh, process issues rather than simply saying I should really have got a, a better grade, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've much greater ability than that, in part because that appeals process when it's likely to report for individuals uh, within an autumn period, you know, th there isn't a particular great advantage to that individual in getting a change at that particular point because the, the key point of entry uh, will be for the following, um, the following year for entry to university, and there will also be the opportunity then for uh, opportunities for uh, students to take those examinations to get away as well. But clearly, it wants to identify if there has been a flaw in the process. If there's been some, um, for example, problem in terms of uh, the data going from the school to the to CCA, or there's been some fundamental mistake uh, made within that. So. It is likely that the, the grounds for, for those appeals are likely to be relatively narrow, but as I said, we've got the second safety net of the opportunity for, um, for students to be able to do a reset, and indeed, uh, indeed, particularly for the years 11 and 13, you know, there is a, a retrospective fitting from, from uh, next year's exams, and indeed the choice where indeed the routes which they go down, if they go down both routes, it will be the higher of those, those results that, that would apply to them. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, and thank you, Minister. Um, 
I'll declare an interest again as a mother of a, a year 13. There will be a number of students who will be very happy with you today. There will be some who won't be so happy because I know in my day when you did mocks, they usually marked them very hard and there's no way I would have got the grades that I got in the end if, if they hadn't scared the life out of me. So getting to my question, thank you. Um, Perhaps the Minister could just outline, CCEA obviously had provided a number of different options for you and you've taken the decision that you have taken. If you could maybe outline what those options were and were those options equality impact assessed and on the basis of equality impact assessment, normally at this time of the year teachers are preparing pupils for post-primary transfer. Will you be taking forward legislation then to cancel that exam in the autumn because the GCSE, A2, AS have been cancelled now? Let's have fairness for those post-primary or P7 pupils. Uh, just on, on a couple of points that, that have been raised, in terms of options, uh, I should indicate, because obviously there's bespoke solutions to each of the four particular bits, there was a range of options for each of those. And so, for example, some could have involved almost a pure statistical data side of it. Some would have involved maybe uh, looking purely at a, a, a teacher bit. So I think, uh, from memory, uh, in each of the four areas, there was a minimum of three options was provided. Each of those was then assessed against, as I mentioned, the four criteria of um, fairness, reducing the burden in the overall system, uh, the limiting the impact in terms of a future position, and also providing provision of certainty. Um, so effectively, there's almost like a form of scoring mechanism and uh, a sort of a, almost like a traffic light system, perhaps, in terms of the fact of whether it was, it was good, fair or poor in doing that. And the option in each case which came forward, uh, which was then the recommendation from SEA, and I also had the full scoring mechanism, if you like, of each of those as well. So I was able to go through each of those myself as well. Uh, but in each case, that the, the preferred option that came in each case from SEA was the one that ultimately I agreed on because it seemed to, to score the best. Uh, look, in terms of the post-primary transfer, uh, no, I don't intend to bring uh, legislation forward um, uh, there are many things this House will agree on and many things it won't. I think post-primary may be one that um, may be a little bit of the holy grail of, of um, seeking levels, levels of agreement on with, with the best will in the world. The examinations themselves are not, as I'm sure the member will be acutely aware, the post-primary examinations that are, that are offered, which uh, pupils can take or not take, uh, are offered by two private organisations, PPTC and AQE. From that point of view, I have and the department has no control over those. So, um, you know, I, I think the extent to which I could prevent a private organisation doing a particular thing uh, would be questionable anyway. We are talking about, because part of this is on the basis of an assessment of, of timescale as well, and it may well be, for example, if we were in a position, uh, I mean, um, we realise that the potentially the, that, um, well, it's up to those organisations, they're normally scheduled for November, whether they it's up to them whether that will precisely happen on the same time scale or not. Um, but part of the issue, I suppose, is that, that there's an immediacy with this. There is actually the fact that um, students would have been going into exams in May and June. If we had had, for example, a situation in which our academic year followed the calendar year, then I suspect the decisions that are made today would not necessarily have happened uh, on the same time scale and may not have happened at all, because there's, there's time, if you like, for things to correct themselves. I think it was important uh, that whenever uh, a decision was issued uh, that there wouldn't be examinations on March 19th, that as soon as was practical that uh, arrangements were put in place. And in particular, I, th I felt it was important um, that we didn't have that uncertainty. If we had, for example, carried on with a situation of hoping that exams would, would take place and then effectively, for want of a better word, pulling the rug from under people's feet at the end of April to say, well, actually, they can't take place given circumstances on it, then that, I think, would have been wrong as well. So it's about that, but I don't, again, see at this stage any particular correlation uh, from that to the post-primary transfer. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister for his statement today. Today's statement and today's discussion has obviously been on academic uh, qualifications and achievement. But I think we have to recognise that this is an extremely stressful time for many, many young students. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of confusion, and I know in my own son, a lot of re regret as well. There's also new pressure on teachers. It's a challenging time for them. 
they're still dealing with the new challenge of remote learning, and now they're having this put on them, this res huge responsibility to virtually dictate the future choices that their students or pupils are going to have. Has the department or the education authority considered what additional support can be given and how it can be accessed for those whose mental well-being is taking a bit of a battering at this time? Look, I, I, I'm very cognizant of the, the issue of the mental well-being, and as part of that, I think we're looking to see what additional support also can be provided um, in general, particularly for our young people and also for our teachers, because sometimes the focus, very understandably, is on our young people. We sometimes almost ignore the, the will of, uh, of teachers, and so therefore, I think sort of moving forward in terms of support that can be provided next year. Uh, we need to look and see what, what support can be given against all of us very uncertain times in terms of uh, budgetary uh, constraints. Yes, there's undoubtedly a, a situation where we're obviously looking at academic results. Uh, I suppose we have been able to bring in elements of this in terms of, of data that can actually then help and assist. Uh, if there are specific helps that are needed, a CCA develops this uh, and works this through with schools, uh, those will be given. In many cases, it is about actually using what is there at present. It, it, it won't be about finding any, any additional material, about collating what is, uh, what is there. And you know, while this will create a level of additional pressure, which I entirely acknowledge on our teaching workforce, again, this is not a unique situation we're seeing in other jurisdictions. Um, we're actually perhaps the only, they don't have the data, and can only, if you like, fall back on the position of uh, teacher assessment. So you know, from that point of view, it's a very tough time I, I can appreciate for everybody. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his statement and his attempts to resolve this conundrum, the, the difficulties that the educational establishment faces uh, uh, as a result of uh, imposing social distancing requirements to protect our young people and, and indeed the entire community. You, you've highlighted on a number of occasions today that teachers will play a, a vital role in going forward in, in this assessment. Can you advise when CCEA will give them detailed guidance so that they will know what exactly will be expected of them and when they will need to start to carry out this work to ensure that this vital um, work is done uh, in an efficient manner? Well, my understanding is that detailed guidance from CCEA to schools, which also then will relate to teachers, um, I, I'm not saying that there won't be at times different layers of this on it, but actually it's going out today uh, with this. I felt it was important that whenever a statement was being made in connection with this, that, that everything was brought into line, that it was not a question of, um, for instance, that, that I was saying this in the Assembly. And obviously, I appreciate it is undoubtedly the case that um, my sort of, I suppose, direct accountability is, is to the Assembly, and so therefore the Assembly um, had sort of first hearing of this. But I also wanted to ensure that there wasn't a gap between what I was saying and what CCA was doing. So that has been um, aligned uh, within that. As part of that, detailed guidance will give a particular period of, of window of opportunity where that information needs to be uh, got from schools to CCA, and the, the detailed format of that uh, will also be made clear to, uh, to schools. The Principal Deputy Speaker, just with regard to the results that the students will receive as outlined by the Minister, are results capped in any way by the proportion of grades awarded to school students from previous years? Are they, they capped? The, the, ca the uh, grades that would be given to a school previously uh, to the students that had come that, that cohort from the previous year, it, and then capped, say, wouldn't be going up or down in any sort of different well, it, way? It, I'm not sure there will be a specific cap as such. What will, will be taken into account is, is uh, they will be looking statistically at a modelling, but which will take into account centre performance. That perhaps is more to do with the fact, as I said, that. Um, while there will be very clear guidance given and instructions to schools as to how this is to be done, um, if you're talking ultimately about people making individual assessments, like anything, I'm sure anybody, for instance, who's been on a, a panel scoring uh, someone, for instance, in an interview process, uh, will find that perhaps they may well create a similar ranking, but, but some will be more generous in their assessment than others. And therefore, this is to take a level of, of account for that. It's quite a sophisticated statistical model which will be developed by CCA to be able to provide that. Ultimately, I suppose, uh, what is important is you've got comparability across the whole system so that 
uh, no particular student is either advantaged or disadvantaged. And that's just not simply from within Northern Ireland, uh, but particularly, uh, you know, even sort of throughout all those who are competing, for instance, for university places. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for a statement. And I want to join uh, my condolences to everybody who have died so far. And we've just heard uh, during the course of the sitting that today, I think, is the, the highest death toll. Um, so, sympathies to everybody who, who have so far died. Um, the Minister, uh, my understanding from what he said, was that AS level students will get a predicted grade, but that will not count towards the final uh, A level grade. Um, if, is that accurate? And could you get some clarity uh, on that? Uh, and also, is he confident that teachers will be protected uh, from any accusations of unfairness or bias which may arise uh, through this process? Is he confident that such uh, mechanisms are in place to, if not stop those accusations, then seriously mitigate against them? Well, uh, just to pick up the, the latter point, I suppose there's two aspects to that. Um, I think there is particular provision um, that, in terms of uh, a determination, uh, and I mean from a legal point of view, to ensure then that uh, teachers' confidentiality in terms of the, the grading system is protected, there are, I feel like, a form of derogations that, that can be put in place and will be put in place um, in relation to that. Uh, there's a wider context, obviously, within that, which will have to be considered in terms of a GDPR side of things and a freedom of information side of it across the UK, because it's UK-wide legislation. And that's something, I think, which is also getting looked at across the jurisdictions, uh, because it, it must be important to teachers that uh, are critical that their judgment, as you like, is protected and that they do not see any potential repercussions from that. Now, I suppose the fact that, that uh, it will not be, while they will have a key component in being able to um, put that in place, uh, then it's not, if you like, their, um, their position alone. Uh, the member just remind me, sorry, the first question uh, was on... Uh, level students. Um, yeah, it, the, the position is there's effectively a form of, of decoupling for, for one year, so it would stand alone in, in relation to that. Uh, the position, though, is, and therefore, somebody could simply leave with an AS level if, if, if they want. Um, now, there are some occasions, there's not every student that, that there is that direct linkage anyway, but for the vast bulk in Northern Ireland, and that's where we differ. Um, but the point, I suppose, is there are still then the opportunities that if someone is carrying on to their, uh, their A2 level, that, that effectively the AS level can then be sort of retrofitted, uh, for want of a better word. And uh, there are the opportunities either to sit in 2021, those particular parts of it, or indeed have a, like a retrospective side of things. But it doesn't therefore become an automatic component which will lead sim simply to an A level. Again, if this was normal times, because I think what actually this process has actually shown, the advantage that Northern Ireland, um, and I think Wales also operates, in terms of the linkage between, between AS and the A2 grade or the, the A-level grade, I think has actually enabled a, a, an element of data to be put in place, uh, which is helpful from that perspective. It has given us options which have not been available in England. But I think realistically, and there is, we're left with no other choice this year in terms of the awarding of the AS side of it, but to, to do that decoupling. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I'm mindful of the fact that we have about 17 minutes left, and uh, no. And as was the case in, pre in the previous session, if any member has any pressing question that they wish to ask the minister, if they were to rise in their place, I would call them. I call Kelly Armstrong. Hopefully this isn't too difficult. Um, earlier I asked about the 11 plus and the reason why I brought it up was because I'm very aware that we have key workers in society today who are not at home with their children, um, who are not able to hothouse them in the way that some others are able to because they've been furloughed or they're working from home. So my concern is about the 11 plus for later in the year is there are children who are being prepared for that test and our key workers, the very people who are keeping us alive and protecting our society and delivering essential services aren't actually in work or they're at, at work at the moment they're not actually at home with their children and that's why I'm asking for the consideration in the 2020 cohort for P7s I think we need to consider um, those children of those very essential workers I understand that and I think that in terms of the way that because obviously the tests are external to government they're external to the Department of Education and I'm sure in terms of detailed consideration AQ and PPTC will, will be looking at that the point is, to some extent, there is, um, and again, I appreciate this is not an area where there's consensus on, but there is a, um, a strong desire amongst at least 
quite a lot of people to have the retention of academic selection, and schools will have to make a level of choice come the summer of 2021. And I think one thing which perhaps hasn't been touched on as yet is uh, the extent to which we want to minimise um, there is likely to be some level of, of difficulties or disruption in terms of placements into post-primary schools for this year, and we want to minimise the, the time frame in relation to that. Um, to that extent, I suppose, ultimately, uh, the AQE and PPTC have got um, ownership of those tests. I don't believe it's my place to try and abolish those or create some one-year difference in, in relation to that. Um, and I appreciate that. I mean, one of the things that I've, I tried to do, and even from a, uh, a previous incarnation, um, there is always, unfortunately in life, and education reflects this as well, there is always going to be a level of advantage for those who have uh, financial resources who are able to, to throw that in bait by way of additional tutoring or whatever. Uh, and obviously one of the decisions that I made in the previous bit was to remove any particular memo or uh, restriction on schools being able to prepare their own pupils, because that created less of a level playing field, and I think uh, that is undoubtedly the case. But look, we will not be in a perfect position, I think, um, on this issue. But I don't intend to bring legislation to um, abolish, even on a temporary basis, academic selection. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister cited cost, complexity and the university application process deadlines as reasons for discounting or rescheduling of exams to, for example, August. Can the Minister go into a bit more detail as to why those issues could not be overcome? No, uh, in terms of the, the rescheduling, sorry, I, I indicated um, I am talking about resets in the autumn because I think what is potentially getting offered England is in a slightly different position from us because they are purely having to rely on teacher assessment, no data. So it is likely that England will have some form of resets in the, the autumn. The point I'm making in relation to that is that if, if universities, for instance, are making their admissions around about the same uh, about the same time, that would actually have potential impact on autumn resets on a cohort entering in 2021. But there will be the opportunity for uh, pupils to take an examination again prior to the, the entries for 2021. Um, the issue, I suppose, is that, that we would have had to have a situation against a situation where I think our data and our process is more robust than elsewhere, where you would, uh, we would have to then be, um, as, as part of it also in the level of cost, um, be able to provide that f for resets for everybody, for every subject, uh, driven by CCA and others. Um, and indeed, with a, a limited amount, because there is that opportunity for, for students to sit again in the summer of 2021, for something that would be, I think, of very negligible benefit to the, the pupils themselves. So that's the route. I mean, again, this is on the basis of strong advice that's come from CCA, and again, discussing this with others. It, it is also uh, the case that, um, and I appreciate some members have raised the issue of consultation, and um, there's certainly been. Uh, in terms of any young people who have been in contact, there has no, been no appetite for autumn resets or indeed a postponement of exams to, to autumn, either on that side of things. So I, I, think it's, I think it's an issue both of the practical difficulties, the costs, and indeed, uh, depending on how things go, we may find ourselves in a situation in the autumn, as nobody knows exactly the passage of this over the next, the next period, where if we find ourselves that you set up a set of exams in September, October time, and then find that there is a second wave of this that we then have to actually then have a different set as well. So, you know, all these things can be kept under review, but um, I'm not convinced of the merits of a separate reset in the, the autumn. I, I don't think it particularly benefits people and there's a level of both cost and complexity that adds to the, the situation. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, and my question follows on from um, the Minister's um, remarks. Um, while people in the ministers and the executive have said over the last day or two that it is entirely premature, and I agree with them, to start talking about when exactly current restrictions are lifted, I wholly agree with that. It is also the case that, as he just mentioned, um, uh, you know, we will see restrictions eased, we all hope and pray, at, uh, at some point sooner rather than later, but also there, there could be a second wave. Is his department thinking and planning now about how you might put in place certain forms of social distancing inside schools and classrooms? 
it's unlikely that they will return before the end of this academic year, and he's been, been pretty clear about that, and, and I think that, that, that's probably the right way to go. But in terms of September and in the future, has, are, are he and, and the, the unions in the department thinking about how those could be implemented now? In terms of that goes wider, obviously, than the examination issue. Look, I, I think we'll, as we move ahead, we'll be looking to scope out um, a sort of a uh, how business can be reoperating in that broader sense. I think one of the issues which makes this particularly uncertain, um, and indeed from those who are much higher level of expertise this, than I would have, is it, it, it may not necessarily be a sort of a, a linear um, move towards. Um, moving back to a greater level of normality. It may involve uh, some things that are geographically specific. It may mean that, to some extent, uh, that there are restrictions kept very tight in some areas um, in terms of life and other areas where there's, there's ease. It may also be the, the case that, um, to some extent, that to be able to manage this in the best possible way, there's almost a form of turning the tap on and off at various stages. So all those things have got to be taken into account. Look, I'll be working with executive colleagues, obviously driven particularly by the health considerations, to see how best that those can be. Uh, I mean, and yes, there is thinking going on in relation to those, but I, I think we don't want to. I don't think anybody wants to send out the signal that this is the time for a particular shift in opinion, as we've seen um, uh, that the executive has indicated as a whole that, that uh, as a minimum, the, the current lockdown will be there in the next three weeks. I suspect all of us anticipate it will probably be a longer period. But you know, we are all living in very fluid um, situations where things can go at times in different, different directions. And I think we have to be able to cognizant that we can scope ahead and actually scenario plan and work out what is the best particular options at particular times. Cora Mayogut, Last Count Cora. And can I put on record my sincere condolences to the families who have 18 families who today have lost loved ones to COVID-19. Um, Minister, you've, you've put forward bold proposals in relation to examinations, and I know it's uncharted territory, and there are no simple solutions here. Um, but maybe a more pressing matter is the issue around vulnerable children, at-risk children, and I know I've raised this on numerous occasions over, over the last number of weeks. What um, liaison has your department had with Barnardo's Child Line or other statutory agencies to hope to help to try and ensure that? every child is safe in their own home now? Well, look, the member will be aware from the education. I, mean, I appreciate this may be straying a little bit outside the remits of the, um, of the statement, specifically in relation to that. There is ongoing work, and I know as part of that, we're working to get, particularly with health, to get sort of a, a full detail guidance that's there. You know, as part of that, we're working with, with um, outside agencies. We've also, as indications, been made, have written directly to schools to try to encourage them particularly to reach out towards uh, vulnerable children. This is a problem which is not just, again, a local problem. It's something that's occurring across that. And um, I hope to be able to raise in terms of trying to see also whether best practice um, on Wednesday uh, of next week, there'll be the, the next meeting of the, um, on the Four Nations Summit in terms of education. And it'll be an interesting conversation we'll have in terms of what are happening in other jurisdictions in terms of vulnerable children as well, so we can all learn as best we can from each other's experiences. Okay, no other members have indicated they wish to ask a, a question. Uh, could I thank the Minister for his statement and uh, his answers? Uh, I think it is to the Minister's credit, given the amount of concern that there was out in the public about this, that he came to this House to make this statement rather than issuing a press release at 9 o'clock this morning, which would have dominated the news headlines. So he showed this House the courtesy that it's entitled to, and I thank him for that. Uh, as long as it's for the right reasons and not the wrong ones. Agenda item four is the date, time and place of our next meeting. We have yet to receive confirmation from the executive about when ministers will next come to make a statement to the ad hoc committee. As soon as this confirmation has been received, written notification of the time, date and place of our next meeting will be issued to members in the usual way. However, I would remind members that a plenary session of the Assembly is scheduled to take place on the 21st of April and that ministers may continue to make oral statements to the Assembly on sitting days. That concludes this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. The meeting is adjourned. Stay safe and God bless. Yes.